off. Item one, can I please ask our clerk, Ozu, if there are any apologies? Apology for absence has been received from Assembly Member Shalomi, for whom Assembly Member McCartney is attending as a substitute, and Assembly Member Pijin has given apologies for lateness. Okie dokie, thank you very much for that. Item two, can I ask the committee to note recommendations item two, and as ever declare any other disclosable pecuniary interests that are not so entered. Thank you very much. Item three, can I ask the committee to confirm the minutes of the meeting on the 15th of November to be signed by me as a correct record. Thank you. Item four, can I ask the committee to note the complete ongoing actions arising from previous meetings of the committee. Thank you very much. Right, substantive item five, getting around to that. Again, welcoming guests to our monthly Q&A question. Um, I shall take the lead in question. Uh, initially, I shall ask the question around Grenfell. Now, the Assembly is doing uh, work around this with different committees, oversight, planning and elsewhere. Um, we are uh, aware that the investigation started um, earlier this week um, and that there is a criminal investigation opened on uh, recently after the fire. Um, the investigation includes examination of various issues and what we wanted this morning is to have an update uh, from yourselves uh, on the investigation as to developments if we could. So questions really to the Met, to Cressida and or Craig, can you provide us with an update on the Met's criminal investigation into the Grenfell Tower fire, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, should start, of course, yeah. by um, remembering the people who were lost in Indeed. the fire and uh, people who have been so deeply affected um, and those who lost their, their homes. Um, and tomorrow, of course, we have the uh, remembrance service at St Paul's. As you know, we, as, as the Met, have been uh, very heavily engaged from uh, the night of the fire onwards uh, in a variety of different functions. Um, and I might at this stage also pay tribute to my officers and staff, um, those who were in the first response, those who have subsequently been working with the community, uh, and those involved in the investigation. Um, it is, of course, uh, difficult work for them, uh, and they do it with enormous um, care and determination. Uh, and would not probably want me even to be acknowledging or thanking them because they recognise the scale of the tragedy for others. Um, we have um, currently 200 odd detectives working on the investigation. As you are, I think, aware, our search of the tower, <coughs> which has been uh, continuing on a seven day a week basis, with our specialist officers who are all volunteers for that role. Um, they have been going through a fingertip search of every single room in every single flat on every single floor. They've sifted over 15 and a half tons of debris. Uh, and um, they have only very recently finished that operation. You'll also be aware that we carried out um, a very large set of inquiries to establish uh, the identity and number of the people who um, have sadly died. And uh, you'll be aware that we, have, uh, we are very confident in the number of 71, which includes uh, baby Logan, the stillborn baby. Uh, so we're absolutely confident around that. Um, there's a huge investigation going on. I've said it's 200 uh, odd detectives. At its peak, it, um, it was around about 400. Um, it will take a considerable period of time. We are working very closely with the public inquiry uh, and we have a um, signed memorandum of understanding between us and the public inquiry uh, and we fully understand uh, the need for them to uh, have total cooperation obviously from us and to be able to get on with their work and overall for um, those most affected and the public uh, to have answers to their questions. Um, 
I think we will be looking at the best part of next year before we finish all the kind of reconstruction and uh, forensic examination. Uh, and as you know, there are a very, very, very large number of people uh, and records to um, for either take statements from or to uh, examine foren forensically. So I'm not going to put a time scale on that. It is a very well-led investigation with a very clear command structure, very experienced officers in all the specialist roles and indeed at uh, senior investigating officer level. I have complete confidence that they will carry out a very thorough, very competent and of course entirely impartial uh, uh, and objective investigation into what has happened. Um, I believe that in very difficult circumstances we are um, keeping uh, those who've been bereaved and indeed uh, those who were residents and who have survived as uh, well informed as we reasonably can and we have very good processes for doing that. And we also, of course, are working closely uh, with the community on a variety of different uh, issues, such as um, you know, approaching the Remembrance Service, as an example. Uh, so this will be a very significant, very important uh, matter for the Metropolitan Police for um, many, many, many months uh, to come, indeed. Uh, I would be astonished if we were finishing the criminal investigation within 12 months. I'm sure it will be much more than that. I hope that helps, Chair. Thank you very much. <coughs> you, you referred to the uh, inquiry. I think there was uh, procedural hearings this week. There were. Which, which you would have um, attended. And that yeah. will be kind of running at length in parallel to your own Indeed. investigations. And, and you said yours is going to go through many months of next year, mm -hmm. and no doubt mm -hmm. that will. How does that, uh, there will be things discussed that are very much in parallel but connected. Yes. Just from my own information, how does that connectivity yes. work over the coming months? Yes. So we are very closely uh, connected, um, and I should perhaps have mentioned also we are closely connected <coughs> with the Crown Prosecution Service, so we've involved mm -hmm. them at an early stage, as you would expect. But in terms of uh, the inquiry, we have... Um, sort of uh, dedicated, nominated lawyers talking to each other. So, that, so the chair of the inquiry is supported by a legal team, as you are aware, and our legal team and their legal team are talking all the time. Secondly, the memorandum makes it clear that we will disclose, obviously, everything to the inquiry. Um, and, uh, you know, we will continue to do that. Um, and uh, then as and when they wish to uh, use information that we've given them or indeed publish information that we have given them, then there will be a further conversation. Um, because what we are all very, I think, anxious to ensure is that both processes can proceed uh, as, as uh, effectively and indeed in as timely a fashion as possible. Um, but it would be um, most unfortunate if anything that one party did undermined the um, capability or the credibility of the other party. So that is why we have to have a, a really close working relationship, uh, and that is what we've got. And um, as you said, this is a, a huge investigation. It is. 200 plus officers running for over, over 12 months, and we're yeah. going to be talking about resources a little bit later, but that obviously um, will make a huge strain on your detective and other, other resources. Do you want to kind of comment briefly around that before we get into resources later? Um, well, yes, it does in the con current context, but I, but I wouldn't want that to sound in any way as though we are doing this, um, you know, anything other than completely no, you would be uh, exactly. properly that's, and willingly. And so, so they are not being cut short of no, the resources. Indeed. On the other hand, they have to, you know, the team are very clear about exactly what type of skill they need when yeah. for what. And we will keep on making sure that that is really managed very, very well. Um, but, uh, yes, I mean, we were a very large police service. Hmm. In the time that um, uh, you have been in the chair, we frequently dealt with large-scale investigations Indeed. of one sort or another. And, of course, currently we have, um, uh, you know, a number of significant things happening in the, in the, in the counter-terrorist world. We are used to flexing. We do have the skills. We haven't called upon any other force to um, assist us in a sort of long-term or substantial manner uh, yet. Uh, obviously, the disaster victim identification teams are mixed teams across London, so City of London and British Transport Police, 
and we have had um, specialist advice from as far away as New York on various aspects, but we're not actually having to bring detectives into the Met to assist. But it does, of course, you're quite right, have an impact on our prioritisation of flexing and surging in other areas. That's very reassuring. Last question for me. If there was an issue raised around the use of uh, police helicopters um, at the time of the incident, and I believe there was certainly two aspects that I'm aware of um, around that, which was, and this is, we have reports of this, is, is people thinking that there would be a, a rescue operation around helicopters, and we only have this as, 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 as reporting, um, and that may have encouraged people to remain, and again, this is reported information. But secondly, again, reported was the um, downdraft, is that probably the wrong word, um, of the helicopters that may have worsened the flames. Now, mm -hmm. it's, it's legitimate of us to ask for some clarification around that because this is questions that have been, have been raised. Would you like to comment at all around that? So simply to say, I think a, 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 a tragedy on this scale, which I think if we all put ourselves back nine months ago was unimaginable, none of us would have been expecting or thinking about something like this precisely, is going to raise an enormous number of questions mm. in people's minds. And it's quite proper that they are um, attended to and dealt, dealt, you know, answered. Um, this is uh, we have received a we have received a complaint in relation to this matter, mm. and there is a investigation right. into that complaint, and that complaint uh, investigation is being managed by the Independent Police Complaints Commission, okay. Okay. Um, as I think you would expect. Yes. Uh, so that it, it would probably be <coughs> inappropriate for me to comment any further, but I'm sure they will wish to, um, you know, get on with that investigation. Indeed. Thank you for that, Sean. Um, yeah, thank you. Um, I mean, obviously, we're now six months on from uh, the disaster, um, and I think people are really hoping we might see relatively swift justice. They don't want to see justice delayed on this. Um, so I wanted to ask you about the offences that may not be related to the scene, because I realise the scene is incredibly complicated and that's taken you a long time to look at. Um, specifically that you're looking at the, the companies involved in potentially the organisations involved in managing the building and how that might have involved some criminality. Can you give us an update on those parts of the investigation that you're doing? Um, have you interviewed any people um, from potential suspect companies or whatever in under caution? Are you thinking about how you, how, which charges you might bring in that respect? So I, I think I do need to go, <coughs> go back a, a step really. Um, and. Um, make it clear that you know we're doing a whole series of things in parallel but if we were to get to the stage of putting a file to the Crown Prosecution Service it would it would uh, in, in relation to this investigation it would clearly need to contain evidence from a variety of different areas including not least the examination of the scene um, so I wouldn't want you to get the impression Sean that if hypothetically uh, we were able quickly to identify, um, which is very unlikely actually, but a particular person or body that appeared to have, in first blush, you know, to be primarily involved in this, uh, we wouldn't be expecting to bring a, 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 a file to the CPS in relation to that body until we've got the rest of the evidence marshalled. And that, I'm afraid, is just the way it has to be. I mean, they, they would just say, well, they, obviously they're alongside us and they're interested, but they wouldn't be prepared to look at a file until we have the full evidence uh, to make a decision. And therefore, it will, I'm afraid, in terms of getting towards a stage where files are going to the prosecution, to CPS, if they do, uh, to prosecute people, it will take some time uh, where we will be at that stage saying, is that, do you believe that there's sufficient evidence and it's in the public interest to prosecute? This is going to be a long operation. And we've always said that, I'm afraid, uh, and there's, there's no way of getting away from that. In relation to the... Um, whole, uh, and I know you've heard from Martin Hewitt on this before, but the enormous number of parties, I mean, we're talking about possibly, I think, 300 different parties involved in um, the uh, uh, sort of um, building maintenance management. And we have to work our way through um, looking at all, all of the evidence in relation to those 300, all the relevant evidence in relation to those 300. Um, 
So I'm not going to give a ticker tape update on who we've spoken to about what, when, as we go forward. I think that would be utterly inappropriate. I think I can say at the moment um, that, um, as far as I'm aware, we have not uh, interviewed anybody, as you put it, under caution. That's as far as I can go at the moment. Okay, um, and the investigation still um, goes on into, I think uh, the number we had was 336 mm -hmm. organisations that you needed to get yeah. information from. Yeah. Um, so within that, you, you're not narrowing that down to a smaller number that you're considering to be more like suspects rather than people with evidence, witnesses? We, we, are, we, we are in touch with 336 organisations. You'll be aware, I think, that we've written to them. Uh, and um, we are ensuring that they do not um, uh, destroy any evidence, of course, uh, and um, we'll, we will be you know, in further communication with all of them. Okay, thank you. Um, so my final question um, relates to, well, companies that might be uh, involved in this tower. Um, obviously, these are companies that do this kind of work in other places too, um, and I'm wondering if, where the, where the bounds of criminality lie and whether you're investing, investigating any other projects where people might have been left at risk of harm, even if they haven't come to harm, if that makes sense. Um, is, are you widening out, once you've identified potential companies, are you widening out to any of their other work? What we are absolutely doing is, um, and have uh, committed to do as we go forward, is that if we identify anything in our investigation, that raises concerns about public safety elsewhere. Mm. We will, of course, contact the relevant organisations and government departments, and we're in very close contact, of course, with the DCLG and have been from day one. Uh, so that is, uh, you know, the government's response has been very clearly to try to identify whether there are any other matters raised or other, any other places where people might be being currently put at risk, and there's an absolute onus on us, which we completely understand if we, un if we identify new issues or different places to, to uh, communicate as quickly as possible. Mm. There's an awful lot going on in local government to yeah. try and identify exactly. places that might be at yeah. risk um, and do something about it to yes. minimise those risks. Yes. Um, but does that come into the criminal investigation at all, though, if there are further risks identified and, and people in danger? At the moment, I'm not aware that it has, but it, of course, if it did, it could. You see what I mean? Yeah. If people have been living in a tower that they know has been left in a very dangerous state that's been identified through this other work, would they would they report it to you, or would you find it anyway? Is kind of my question. Um, I think, I, I mean, clearly, if people f if if people are aware whether there are a local authority, somebody who runs a building, or somebody who lives in a building, that there is a specific risk which they think could amount to, because of negligence or some other thing, could amount to something which could be a criminal a criminal matter, then they should be reporting that okay. equally. Um, it's our job, and these are very complex issues, as, as you well know. We're working with the, you know, the experts in, in building investigation and building regulation. Um, it's our job to keep other regulatory bodies, for example, informed. Uh, and if we come across something which looks like a criminal offence, of course we'll, 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 we'll either take that into our investigation, if that's appropriate, or we would put it to you know, the appropriate police service to consider and scope. But I'm, at the moment, I'm... I'm uh, yeah, I'm not aware that we have identified any of those. Okay, thank you. Um, <clears throat> yes, you've spoken, Commissioner, with some pride in the fact that you haven't sought permanent um, specialist help in your investigations on this. The thing which does concern me about this is the large number of frontline police officers, and you sp uh, mentioned mm. specifically mm. detectives, mm -hmm. who are involved in this work. You've told us the large number of people that you need to interview, the vast amount of evidence yeah. that is required. Yeah. I wonder whether or not you have actively considered perhaps hiring uh, recently retired uh, officers to do this kind of work. I seem to recall in a previous um, existence, when we had these discussions at the MPA, there was a a, a list of the kind of things where you will bring in these mm -hmm. people. I think the, uh, the one that most springs to mind, uh, there was, a, 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 in, in relation to missing children, the large number of interviews which need to be taken, knocking on doors of neighbours, and it was specifically suggested 
uh, by your colleagues at the time that this was an ideal area for not using frontline officers but bringing people in. Sure. It seems to me that for much of the um, inquiries, you know, of, of the I can't remember how many thousand witnesses you said, you said there were. But is it really appropriate that you should be taking people from current frontline work to do that when you could bring in people who have experience of this, who, for example, have recently retired? Sure. So t to be clear, we, um, I should probably have been slightly clear, we are using um, long-term specialist uh, resource for, um, for the building examination. Obviously, that is not our of um, area of expertise at all. And there is a body who have specialist investigators there. So they are long term on that. Yes. In relation to um, the rest, and you need to think of it, I think, in, and you are, in terms of all our other investigations, um, we've obviously got a limited budget. You'll be aware of that. Yes. And uh, we've also got um, uh, the opportunity on occasion, but it's usually more expensive. But you'll remember we did it after 2005 and the bombings to ask other police services to send people down on a long-term basis. And what I was trying to say was, we have not done that. However, within our current approach to uh, investigations, where actually, as you know, we have a shortage of skilled current detectives across the Met because we have so many detective posts and so many detective demands, we absolutely do have, across the board, a whole series of people who are recently retired, or contractors, fl a, a flexible workforce, if you like, who have particular skills who you wouldn't be putting out in uniform to deal with tonight's trouble, but are um, taken on on a variety of different contracts. And they are being used, for example, um, to service some of the uh, work that is going on to support some of our interaction with public inquiries, such as the undercover policing inquiry. Uh, and um, we do use them in a variety of different areas as well. So, for example, within sexual offences investigations, we've got some recently retired people who've come back in. Craig may want to say something because he actually wrote to yes. all yeah. our recently retired officers yeah. not so long ago to say, would they be interested in helping us? Yeah. It's actually quite a rare skill to get. They're in demand, so there are a number of agencies out there who provide this. You'll know, those of you who sit on the Budget and Performance Committee in April, uh, sorry, in January, you'll question me on why is the agency budget line so expensive uh, in the Met budget. That's the reality of, of where the people, the Commissioner describes, are shown in our budget line. Um, most forces in the country are seeking these sorts of people at the moment. Um, so there are a number of specialist websites you can go on and see that sort of uh, availability, but we do absolutely make use of that and flex the resources accordingly. So in a lot of the specialist investigation world, there are quite a number of those people. I'm specifically relating this to Grenfell and yeah. the very large number of, I mean, this is not an insignificant number no, of officers no. that, that, that you have described. No. And those people presumably being taken away from their current duties, which may have been uh, uh, frontline uh, of some kind or another. Um, and given, and, and it's you who said it yourself, you know, the thousands of statements which need, need to be taken, do you actually need frontline warranted police officers, for example, to take statements? For all, no, not always, not for all statements. And um, I think we're agreeing, actually, yeah. actually Tony. Mm -hmm. I, I cannot tell you how many uh, people who are not frontline are currently within that yes. 200. Yeah. But there will be quite a lot. Yes. There will be people who perhaps are on restricted duties. Yeah. There will be people working in the major incident room who aren't frontline people. And some of them, probably, and I'll come back to you, are contractors. Yeah. What I expect is my senior investigators and their managers to look across the whole flexible workforce and say, here's an issue, and in this case it's Grenfell, what is the best disposition of skills to put there? Where do I get them from? How do I have least impact on other things that really count? And that will include some <coughs> of the recently retired that you're talking about. Yep. And absolutely, taking statements is, is precisely what some recently retired people do. 
Well, I, I, I'm pleased to hear that. You've also mentioned, and, and has the deputy, about the costs of this, you know, yeah. and, and that you were given a hard time at budget for so on, um, about the cost of independent contractors. Well, of course, when an event of this kind takes place, and particularly given the timescale you've given us, it's going to run into very many millions. Yes. I, mean, I was looking at the cost, for example, of the Bloody Sunday inquiry. Hopefully this won't go on for nearly as long as that. But I'm, I, I'm intent to win it. Now, that, that's our job as members to put pressure on MOPAC and the Mayor to see that perhaps, and indeed the Home Office, to see that there is a separate budget specifically uh, for this one. And I would not like to think that on this you are constrained by budgetary uh, matters. And I've no doubt um, the Deputy Mayor will tell us that you're already seeking funding for have this. Have been yeah. for some time. I'm sure she would. Yeah. <laughs> Sorry, she would still have no, seeking no, we absolutely, yeah. um, uh, you know, I don't, I, the Home Secretary okay. will not mind me saying yeah. <laughs> that I discussed this with her at a very early stage. Yes. And um, we, we are um, cautiously hopeful uh, that we will be able to make um, applications for this year yeah. uh, in relation to the special grant that uh, can be made available mm -hmm. from the government uh, in relation to both the terrorist attacks and Grenfell. And I have made it clear that this is an investigation which will go on into future years and that therefore that needs to be factored in as well. So we will wait to see. Do yeah, I mean, we discussed this, I mean, we have discussed this and officers are discussing it with the Met as well, but we discussed this yesterday in terms of putting in that submission around a special grant to ensure that we do get the refunds because it is a substantial amount of money. Thank you. Thank you, Chairman. <coughs> and, and thank you for answering those, those, those <coughs> questions. The next set of questions is reflecting on the recent HMIC <coughs> FRS report, uh, November 17. Um, and this, this is connected to what we've been talking about, which is about demand and re resources. And in that uh, report, the Met was downgraded um, on how well does the force understand demand to require improvement and continues to have required improvement on how well does the force use its resources. So some, some broad issues there that we've got some questions on. Uh, Len, did you want to lead on that? The first, it's a very straightforward question. Do you accept that judgment in terms of that downgrading that you had from the previous year? Um, I wasn't here in the previous year. Um, we, and I know you've heard from Martin Hewitt already on this, um, and I think also from Sophie, who's got her own view. Um, uh, we do not think uh, that um, all, the, all the sort of evidence that goes to the assessment is entirely fair. We have debated this uh, with uh, Her Majesty's Inspector. <coughs> we don't agree. I don't agree. Um, but, of course, within the criticism, there are things that we are very well aware of and are either fixed already or need to be further fixed. Um, and it is their job to decide what, how to moderate that and how it um, compares both with last year and with other forces. But in short... Short question, short answer, no. Okay, so you don't accept it, but what, so what actions are the Met taking about assessing demand them? So what's the Met way forward yeah. on this issue? I'm going to ask Craig okay. to, to answer so here. He probably wants to say it? something yeah. on Tell why we don't completely agree thing. first. Yeah. Yeah. Paint some pictures for us. Yeah. So, so and, and we have these sort of professional uh, conversations with HMIC virtually on a monthly basis about inspections. So you'll be aware this week that the inspection has been published into legitimacy when the Met has been graded as good. Um, so this is an ongoing process that uh, we do throughout the year. I think in relation to the two issues they identified, and I think it's important, this is where uh, sadly the devil is in the detail, the two issues identified in particular uh, around demand. So the issue about 101 and call handling, we would agree with them. We had a problem with call handling. What they called out was a failed recruitment process in the call handling centre. Feels a bit harsh to get a downgrade on that basis. Um, I've run many recruitment processes. They're not always a success uh, in terms of doing it. And the snapshot of time, we said it's not helpful in the way they do it. So in terms of the pure answer of how do you assess demand, we do an awful lot to assess demand uh, in terms of both in call handling in terms of where we do it and operationally across the various parts of the organisation. So there's all sorts of predictive software and analysis in call handling uh, that assess demands. In a similar way, we have that, <coughs> as you would expect, with crime and other things. 
you know, they were quite complimentary about some of the work we're doing about identifying new demand uh, in terms of doing it. So we've shown we can actually do that. I thought, and the area that uh, uh, we discussed at some length with HMIC, I thought the criticism around the pathfinders was particularly harsh. Uh, it felt like, um, don't trial anything, just do it, was the feedback that sort of came back. And, and the push within a context, and it fits within that wider envelope of resources. At times, it feels the debate uh, uh, with those who inspect and audit is completely free of the vacuum of we're operating in a resource-constrained environment. So if you don't like this choice, what's the other choice you make? And, and understandably, if you sit the other side of the table, you say, well, Craig, that's not my choice. It's up to you to make those decisions. But you do need to understand the context in which we operate to be able to make some of those assessments. So whilst we, whilst we were professionally and personally disagree with that, absolutely working to, to look at what we can do and to address that. The other one that I think was in the context we said, really, for an organisation of our size, is this thing about you need to skills audit everyone. Um, you know, I, I can say this as a, a, someone who's not done my entire police service in, in the Met. That was easy where I've worked before. To do that for 40,000 people and keep that current feels like an entire team of people doing something where I'm unsure of the business outcome we gain from that investment. So that's probably the... We're going to talk about the pathfinders and the skills issue, so let's go back to demand. Yeah. I think it would be worthwhile you write, write into this committee a very comprehensive way about the Met analyses that demand, because not just in terms of response to the bill, but what else you're doing. Yeah. I want to now take you to uh, a further study and a newspaper article where the Met says it's about domestic violence. So in some of these independent, it was found um, across, this is an FOI request, I presume, or some other source, um, one in nine domestic violence incidents failure to attend. The Met's response was, um, it, it said, Unless would have to review three different computer systems which would be too costly. How do we assess whether you are attending domestic violence? You referred earlier in terms of attendance issues and about, um, you know, in terms of that systems. Is this really correct in terms of the Met's response on this issue? Because this is about assessing demand. It's about whether you're meeting the needs of coming. And, you know, clearly domestic violence is a priority for you in terms of that, failing to attend. Hmm. So, what can we do? If we can't do three computers, could we do one? Or do you do, uh, is there another way of assessing whether you're able to attend <coughs> instances or you're attending them in the right time? So, Len, I did see the article, but I'm afraid I don't have it in front of me, and I'm not, uh, I should be, but I'm afraid I'm not familiar with what the specific Freedom of Information request was. But what I can tell you is that on a daily basis, we look at... Uh, domestic violence attendance at calls. So we look at the emergency calls and how many of, of them we are attending in the um, target time and similarly with other, other calls. And we do that, all, all, I would expect all borough commanders yeah. to be looking at that on a daily basis. Craig and I have a quick glance at it in the morning. So we know that it's part of our you daily could management give us a stuff. rough assessment without going back in, they're asking for an anal analysis of five years, I don't really <laughs> need that. Yeah. But there must be, if you're collecting that at <coughs> local level, borough level, yeah. you must, it must be coming yeah. somewhere into the sausage machine, into the centre. No, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So could you provide that to yeah. us? No, I mean, I can, tell you, yeah. I can tell you now, for example, uh, in, for November, our emergency um, calls attended in under 15 minutes, i.e. The, the, that's the target time for an emergency call. Um, the median time is 10, 10 minutes, and 84% um, of them were, were in target, and that's actually been going up recently. And see, Does that's that help? I was surprised by the Met's response. No, I, I, I think there's an important Sorry? point about FOI requests <laughs> here to be really clear. I, I mean, no, no, really, FOI requests, and it's don't take it from me, take it from the Information Commissioner, we get more FOI requests than just about any other public sector organisation. We are putting more and more resources into servicing FOI requests that are designed in that way to just produce lead tables. And if it doesn't meet the criteria, if it's going to cost us more money to produce it, we will actively say... What I'd expect, Craig, sorry to cut through, but in terms of the, the time, 
is that if we weren't going to do that, that's fair, fair dinkum. Yeah. You know, quite frankly, yeah. the cost issue. But if you've got other materials that you've got, then I'd expect us to put them in the public domain because we shouldn't we, be frightened of that. We, because no, we, it's about the mission to explain about the absolutely. complexities of policing, isn't it? And, we, and the difficulties you're yep. facing in dealing with demand. And we do. So oh, if you go on the dashboard... not on this occasion. No, no, but, but, it's, but that's well, why you've got to be really careful well, about FOI. Why don't you refer them to the dashboard, then? We, we do. do. We do. Right, we, okay. But they don't print... Back. Of course they don't print it. It's the same well, as the... In, sorry to interrupt. That is in the nature of, um, of freedom of information. You know, we put... We, my default position is we will put as much, much information, information out into the public yeah. domain as we possibly okay. can. Now, with response times, they are very important, but they're not the only way of looking at a problem. And, of course, with my people, they are very alert to their response times yeah. and whether they're coming in on target. I'm equally interested, as you would be, in what do they do when they get there and is that of the highest the quality that we should expect and, the, and that the complainant should expect. But we put out as much information as we can, but if somebody has a particular yep. angle on the information, as is usually the way with the Freedom of Information request, sometimes it causes an... It's, it's, you know, they're not satisfied with what we've got. Yeah. Hmm. Same with senior board. officer expenses or whatever. We put out as much as we possibly can and then some people just want to analyse, have it analysed in a, for five different ways and that's when it can become overburdensome. Uh, just the last question generally about the Peel report and those issues. So I'm reading various briefings and I delve into the report yeah. and I get the feeling of some of the issues and I, in terms of your answers, what's down to capacity mm. issues? i.e. police numbers or people to deal with issues around that the inspectorate is raising, what is down to inefficiency? Has the Met done any <coughs> report that says, actually, that's about the way that we work and we could do it better? This is about a capacity issue and about choices, whether we put it on that issue rather than that issue. Well, I, I think is I would that say... a fair question? Yeah, Just it's running a good through question. it, it's a good I don't, question. what work have so, you done on that? So I think the reason, one of the reasons that we are, um, you know, we've been running <coughs> the Pathfinders and looking at running the transformation programme in the way it is, is in order, in a uh, constrained financial <coughs> environment, to be assured that we are giving the best possible service locally, streamlining local policing, uh, both in the response function and in safeguarding and in terms of investigation of more serious crimes and in neighbourhoods. And that is exactly the exercise that we've been through for that yeah. that has given us the, uh, an answer which suggests this is the way to go um, structurally. So there's, a comp there's both a capacity issue and there's a rising demand yeah. issue, of a very significant one, as you know, um, and there's an efficiency issue uh, there and all three come together in, in, a, in a different approach. Okay. I'll pass it on to my colleague. So I'll finish first, I think. Sorry. Or did I you? think um, um, Andrew's going to come in a different theme. I just want to carry on on the theme you? of domestic violence and abuse. Right. Andrew, go ahead. Right, you, you, Can I come in? Very good. Domestic violence, yeah. Yeah, no, just to no, carry no, on sorry. that theme, Chair, if I may. Um, Commissioner, good morning. Um, <laughs> last week, the Evening Standard reported that the Met are looking at gender-based hate crime. Uh, this issue, which I've been raising with the mayor over the last 12 months, I wrote to him in October 2016, asking him to look at uh, what Nottinghamshire are doing about recording uh, this particular form of hate crime. I raised it at mayor's question time last month. Uh, his response was not as forthcoming as I thought it would be, so I wrote to him again. And then I noticed the article in the Evening Standard, uh, which said that uh, you would be looking – you'd be speaking with other UK forces to assess whether it's worth cracking down on gender-based hate crimes. Um, so where are we with this? Can I ask you what have you found so far from your discussions with other police forces? What are your thoughts on whether gender-based hate crime can play a part in stamping out the thin edge, quote, the thin end of the wedge of a culture which contributes to violence against women and girls? Um, so I can't tell you uh, where we have got to in our conversations with others um, because I haven't been doing that myself. I'm waiting for um, a, uh, a kind of report from others about how Nottinghamshire have, get, have got on. Uh, and I absolutely do have my hate crime lead talking to other forces around the country. But I, they haven't been to see me on this subject latterly, and indeed I haven't asked them to. We will be having a conversation probably at the management board about this at some point in the future. I can't tell you when. Of course, I am as, uh, I think, concerned about violence against women and girls as anybody and indeed uh, um, you know I've spent my whole life being concerned about uh, how um, we in the police carry out our functions in a manner that which will uh, support uh, you know women and girls in the community 
I have to say I am quite sceptical about this, and um, Sophie and others uh, know this. Um, for me, the jury is very much out. Uh, most of what you are talking about will be manifest in uh, antisocial behaviour, perhaps reports, harassment reports, other crime reports, um, and uh, we do have some, you know, strong legislation that supports our hate crime work. I am very sceptical about whether this is a sensible way to um, use police resources in order to protect women and girls better. I appreciate the point you're making about the use of police resources to discuss this matter with the deputy mayor. Uh, and there are practical difficulties as well. Um, but don't you accept, and the quote that I gave you, that was from, I think, one of your police colleagues, that it would play a part in stamping out this particular culture which can lead on to uh, other forms of more sort of uh, direct forms of harassment. I mean, surely shouldn't you be cracking down on what may seem to be you know, uh, simple things, but nonetheless are very distressing yeah. for the people that are receiving and wolf whistling and so on? And here we are talking about so, recording it to get a picture of the situation. It's a complicated issue. You know, it, I, I talk to, to my friends and my younger friends as well and say to them, you know, casual sexism, what is it like? Mm. How do you perceive it? What's the impact? I, I'm familiar with it. I'm deeply skeptical about the use of scarce police resources to clamp down on wolf whistling. Yeah, yeah. I'm afraid. Yeah, yeah. <coughs> I think there's a case. <laughs> To be made but it, it's, it's a complicated issue, yeah. and I'm very happy to discuss it yeah. further I'll, in the future. I'll say to the committee. But you, you are looking right. into it. Right. Yeah. I mean, the evening standard article is yes, right. Absolutely. We, we are, are looking at yeah. what, what yeah. Nottinghamshire, yeah. And, yeah. And, and it's really important. Yes. They're at a very early stage of trying this, some of those other places. So there isn't an evidence base at the moment to say you, you wouldn't do it on moving from where you are now to <laughs> where they've gone. Let's yeah. have a look. Yeah. Okay. All right. Okay, th yeah, I, I think the committee has diverse opinions. We could have a heated debate ourselves, which yeah. we won't uh, impose upon you. Right, moving on to the capacity and communications. Andrew. Thanks. Yeah, a number of issues from the uh, HMIC report. Yes. Um, and Craig mentioned the 101 number, and I wanted to start on that, because that's an issue I've raised a number of times. And I saw from the figures from an MQ I had answered, a little while ago, that were in the tens of thousands, indeed there's some in the hundreds of thousands of calls that went uh, astray. Um, and we know that you've got, or had at the time, 120 vacancies, high sickness and turnover, difficulty in recruiting, recruiting. and so forth. Um, I, I wonder where you got to in trying to tackle this particular issue, because presumably if you've got, say in September, 78,000 abandoned 101 calls, inevitably that will impact on your crime numbers because, for example, some of these are going to be reporting so-called low-level crime, antisocial behaviour and so forth, uh, and that would impact on, on, the, on that figure, for example. Y yes and no. It could do. Um, well, it I could think do. We, we just don't know. It, but but it'd be worth, I'd, I'd encourage members, it'd be worth, if, when you do one of your visits, come in to a look at 101, because we keep on the wall there what the sort of top ten calls are for 101. Um, and the sort of volume calls. They're not always uh, crime related. So in relation to, the, to, the, to um, uh, addressing the recruitment thing, we've got 460 candidates going through an assessment centre at the moment, uh, where our current pass rate is showing about half of them are getting through. Um, and we're looking at the um, 60 new recruits per month from March, which will deliver the 200 to 250 new members of staff trained we need. Uh, it is an area we're looking at very, very closely uh, in terms of what can we do in there, because it is a it's a very, very pressurised working environment, and the staff in there do a, do an amazing job in terms of uh, of what they do. You'll be aware we've done some work, and, and I don't like the phrase, but about moving demand, channel shift, as uh, as lots of local authorities do uh, refer to it. So that's some of the stuff about how we take crime online through telephone reporting and moving some of that work out there the enhanced website offer around both crime and road traffic incidents uh, in terms of that. So there's a range of things going on to address that volume increase in demand. I think, you know, because we've spoken about this previously here, this is something at the moment the police service nationally is struggling to explain why particularly not just the 101, but why the 999 calls have, 
have, have risen so much over a period of time. And actually, although we thought ours had risen a lot, where we'd seen sort of, you know, 12% rises across the last 12 months in terms of doing it, we seem to be at the smaller end of that when we've talked to some of the other forces. And we don't fully understand the rationale for that yet. Oh, well, well, thanks, Alan. So I think it'd be helpful if we could know what the, what the top 10 reasons for calling 101 is. Yeah, of course, is, you get that for you. If we yeah. get that, yeah. that information, yeah. Yeah. I think it'd be helpful. Yeah. Um, but going back to the thing you, you've just given us, um, are the, are the, if I were to ask for the numbers in October, November, December, are they going to be the same order as we saw previously? Or are they actually starting to improve? So are you, are you talking to the unanswered, the rebounds? Un unanswered, yeah, I, can, I, I can give you all of those. I won't read them all out, but I'm more than happy to give you all of those. Yeah, I mean, the point I'm getting to is, are we seeing a gradual improvement? Are we going to have a, a major improvement in March and, or a gradual You're, improvement the, till then? The big improvement comes as the new staff start to come onto line in terms of that. So there's a number of quite short-term things that have been put in place in terms of doing it, but the major improvement starts to be as, the, as more and more staff come into place. Okay. Um, the other thing we're looking at, uh, and uh, uh, Commissioner and I are just briefly commenting on that, is whether any of the 101 represents in a 999 demand. That's actually incredibly hard to do for a whole region of technology reasons about whether that, that part of a call is grabbed by the operator, but we're looking at that, because that's about, one of the theories. What about the other way around? The 999s get downgraded to 101? Yeah, you do occasionally get that, but that's done on answering. Yeah, okay, yeah, of course. Okay, and, um, so if we could have the numbers, yeah, of course. numbers and, and, the, and the top 10, yeah. that would be helpful. Um, going, going on to another point you made, uh, Craig, about disagreeing with the report on the skills and capabilities audit. Um, on Monday, the mayor said that the officer numbers are likely to go down to 26,900 by 2021. Yeah. So, you won't be, I mean, you said 40,000 people, but it's going to be about, well, about two thirds of that, I suppose. Well, you've got to do, do, you think, do you think when you're going to, if, if we do end up in those sort of numbers, and I'll come back to that in a bit. If we do end up with those sort of numbers, isn't it more important that you actually are aware of what skills people actually have to, in, in how you deploy people yeah. and, and deal with the, the obviously much increased pressures from imposing officers with smaller numbers and a rising population? No, no. So I, I absolutely agree with part of your Can I just come back to your numbers point? When we're quoting numbers, we've got to remember there's police staff, there's volunteers, yeah. there's PCSOs. Yeah. So when I quote 40,000, I'm not talking about just police officers. Well, I saw that. I mean, like, so, you know, around 30,000 no, officers. No, no, so, no, three, no, yeah, yeah. so three quarters of those will be... Yeah, will no, be no. So I, but I, I think it is important because we sometimes, in our language, forget the other people who are absolutely essential in, no, I, in I, making I, I the city tick uh, yeah. uh, in terms of what it does. So going on to, to the skills audit point. No, I absolutely get the... the, the, the the purest point behind what you're saying, but that's where you get into some really quite difficult details as to what you're talking about in the skills audit. So do we know that when we send a uh, response car, call sign, whatever, to a job, that the people in there have been trained in crime investigation, they're capable of driving the car, they are taser trained and it's current, they are first aid trained and it's current, they are officer safety trained and it's current. Yes, absolutely, we know all of that. If you get to the level some of the uh, demands seem to be placed on about do we know every single skill they might have, whether they speak three different languages or, or do so? No, we don't know that level of detail. And frankly, to gather every bit of that information and have it in a way you could use it that would make an impact for the people at the front, i.e. the people we're serving, seems an incredibly bureaucratic process. Where I think HMIC uh, and the skills audit stuff is right, so when you look at certain levels across the organisation, do we, as part of our long-term workforce planning, now look at have we got enough senior investigators to cope with incidents like Grenfell or three or four of those, anyone? Absolutely, that's part of what we're doing. What HMIC are asking for is you need to do that for every role across every part of the organisation. And at the moment, we're saying, look, we don't see the business benefit for doing that for every person. We absolutely do around roles and key roles. So would we want to end up in a scenario where we've got no kidnap trained SIOs in the Met? Of course we wouldn't, and of course we plan to replace that. Do we want to end up with no chief officers with a crime background? No, and we plan for those sorts of things. But it doesn't mean we skills audit down to every PCSO and volunteer on a front counter across the Met. So, you, so it's a skills audit light that you do? Well, it's, it's skills audit based on need. Yeah. So, I, so, so, you know, you can be very purist about skills audits, and I've worked in places where they do, and you skills audit, but it's got to be about outcome and need for the public we serve. No, I understand that, and I think that's a fair point. Is there a line that you would draw between what you think is appropriate to 
look at. Uh, and, and that's part of the debate we had. No, absolutely. And that's part of the live debate we had with HMIC. And, and in fairness, and you can, you'll speak to the HMI uh, at some point, they would recognise this is of a completely different scale when you're talking about an organisation the size of the Met. <coughs> you know, you, you, we talked about 40 odd thousand. You're talking with most forces they look at, two to three thousand people. Um, that's a very so, different thing. Have you agreed with HMIC where the line is, or oh, that's part is, of our no? In fact, that's, 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 that's part of our ongoing discussions. So you know, and it's really clear. You can get lots of recommendation from HMIC, as you do from yeah. external auditors, national audit office, other people. It doesn't mean you have to do them all. You should have a professional conversation and say, look, on the basis of this, we're going to do this. On the basis of this, we think we're going to do that. That's part of having a professional working relationship. And we have a really good professional working relationship with okay. HMI. So ha have you put a pitch to HMI, see if you want a better word about where you think the line is? Oh, we're having that debate with them as you speak. Okay. Yeah. So can you share that, some of that information with us? I will do as I do it, yes. Yeah. Okay, thanks. And now I want to go on to the borough mergers and, and, and the path <coughs> And um, this is something we've been around the houses quite a few times on over the last few months, uh, as, as we all know. Uh, and the last time we discussed about this, we were... Um, I asked about savings figures, and there were no figures available, which I found rather surprising. Um, and we were told that the savings figures would be available by December. Are they available? I haven't got them with me. So what we discussed last time is what the specific savings figures were for the, for the, um, the restructure. What both myself and Martin Hewitt talked about was Martin talked about actually this, this uh, remodelling of the BCUs was in order to ensure that we could provide the service to the public that the Metropolitan Police oh, needs to provide I'm going to come on to with that. fewer officers yeah, because we know we're coming to, down come and actually more. that's part of the savings. And what I can I just finish? What I, des what I described as well was that through the Pathfinders, we were, you know, obviously there's been a lot of learning through the Pathfinders and there's been a tweaking of the model and what was coming forward in December was um, a business case and an evaluation. That's still, that's not yet complete. We're, you know, it will be complete soon. And then we will have, you know, a much better understanding of some of the financial figures, but also just that we know, and this discussion that Martin talked about, that in order to deliver the service to the public, this restructuring of the basic command units enables that to happen as officer numbers come down. Well, I've got the transcript here in front of me mm -hmm. from, from the last time we discussed this. And you're right, you said we have... You, you expect to see the business case in December, which yep. you then said kind of you'd share, share with me as yep. one of the uh, members affected. So you're saying the business case is not available yet? We No, we have, it's, coming, it's coming forward. In, I mean, it's been worked on at the moment. I was hoping it would be ready by now. It's, you know, there's a lot of work. We haven't got a lot of December left. No, before. we haven't. No, I know. We're, we're working right up to the, you know, Christmas period, so. And the other thing you said was, specifically on the savings, this is separate from the business case, yep. Uh, we should have that figure by December. Well, the business case, I mean, it, it, I'm just going to repeat what I've said, really. The business case and the evaluation of the Pathfinders has looked at and is looking at the remodelling, some of the tweaking around that, so you'll have, have that in there. But it, overarching strategically, the restructure of the basic command units really is so that the Metropolitan Police can deliver the service with fewer officers. And we know that we're, we're already coming down. With the Mayor's been very clear, the Commissioner's been very clear that you know, in the next financial year, we are going to average about 30,000. We need to continue to provide that service to the public. So that, if you think about the savings there from, you know, in terms of the officer number coming down, that is part of, the, you know, part of what is happening yeah, with the restructuring. I'll, I'll, I'll come back to officer numbers uh, in, in a bit. And, and last time you did fairly talk about service improvement and so forth. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I was pushing you particularly on objective criteria alongside that in terms of response times, for example, and uh, I, I particularly put to you the evaluation in hard terms, uh, hard numbers in terms of the savings, which I just mentioned, attendance times and, and all those sort of things. And we still haven't actually had any hard numbers about what would be acceptable other than what's acceptable, which is uh, how long is a piece of string, really. Have we yet got any objective criteria to look at these? I mean, some of the assessment about the service improvement, I accept, is probably going to be to a degree subjective. You know, are you doing a good job on, on, uh, on vulnerable people, for example? But hard numbers like attendance times is an objective number. 
I think last time we did yeah. talk about what those hard numbers would be. Uh, Met, no, no the, you, you talked in general terms, but not okay. what they were. So the Metropolitan Police has targets on attendance yes. of, uh, for 999 yeah. calls. I would expect that in the pathfinders, and indeed they are, it's not that I would expect yeah. it, I have seen it coming through week after week when I look at the figures to ensure that the pathfinders are meeting those, you know, what, what is the percentage that they're meeting those targets in terms of attendance to 999 calls? Is it in line with the Met average? And is it, what does it look like compared to previously as well? Those are figures that I've, I've had, I know that I'm pretty sure I've written to the committee about. Yeah. Certainly it's been um, in a number of letters and in, um, but it's, those are figures that we have and can, we can share them with you before, uh, straight after this committee. They are part of the evaluation. Um, we know that actually in terms of the pathfinders, they are back up and have been back up and above, now and above. Um, uh, is above the yeah. met average and above what they were before. So those are very hard figures that we have. But that is just about response times. And obviously, as you've already, you know, you've already said, the pathfinders absolutely number one criteria is to ensure that response times are right. But there are a, a lot of other things within the pathfinders, including safeguarding the vulnerability and improving the service to the vulnerable that needs to be, uh, that is being looked at. Um, so we can have the, uh, I mean the most up-to-date figures I've seen, I think, are October. Um, so can we have the up-to-date yes, figures? Um, uh, going on, continuing on the question of the evaluation, one of the issues I put to you last time was involvement of the Safe and Neighbourhood Boards in that process mm -hmm. uh, and the fact they hadn't actually, they'd been told they were going to be involved but hadn't actually been. Uh, and I've, I've, I've seen the correspondence with the Safe and Neighbourhood Board in Camden, of which uh, I'm a member. Uh, and what I'm concerned about is they, were get, they were, had an email from the borough commander saying, sorry, I'm, the joint borough commander say, sorry, we haven't had time to have a meeting. These are the questions I want to ask. That was the 28th of November, a Tuesday. I want your response by the following Monday, the 4th of December, which is not exactly giving a voluntary organisation very long to look at it. And when we look at the questions they were asked uh, to, to comment on, uh, none of those actually related to police performance at all. Um, about communications, engagement, governance and leadership, but not the sort of things that are the, are, are the meat and drink of, CSA, uh, of, the, of the Camden Safe Neighbourhood Board, actually looking at police performance. So when they responded, their response was, the general feeling was, quote, we didn't have enough information to make informed comment, the questions asked were not appropriate, the Pathfinder had not been running long enough to have learned lessons and the timescales for feedback from the CSNB were unrealistically short. That was their view of what they'd been asked to do. And as far as they were concerned, the, the impression I get is that they felt this was just a tick box exercise to say they'd been asked. The lessons they learned were uh, the MOPAC and MPS should engage more with SNBs prior to mergers. The board didn't have enough information to make a constructive evaluation. They had concerns about the resilience of the, of the senior leadership team uh, and that uh, the police should relate to the areas in which they serve, which are generic general comments back to what were in, in effect very general questions rather than asking them what do you think of the performance in terms of for example response responses to emergency calls and I can tell you they're not happy um, that sort of thing now they think they were not really being properly involved in this process perhaps I could I could yeah. um, start there so I'm sorry they feel like that well, I'm not surprised um, I uh, know that there were some difficulties to get into the specifics. I know there were difficulties uh, organising a meeting that with both, because of course it's Camden and Islington, yeah. that became a problem and that's why we ended up with a letter. That feels with that short time scale to me to be rather clumsy and I completely accept that. Um, on the other hand, <laughs> the um, Pathfinder had been running for a long time. This is a group of people who are heavily interested and close to the, bar the borough and are thinking about these issues all the time. And they are one of tens of parties who would want to have some input at some stage or have a view. Have a view. Um, and I think there has been, throughout the Pathfinders, a considerable amount of consultation with a variety of tens of parties. As they, before they started, I wasn't even here, and as they started, and during, and Sophie's been out on the road lots of times, we've all talked to lots of people in lots of ways, there will come a moment, and it's coming quite yeah. soon, where the commissioner needs to decide how she is going to organise her people. And, of course, because it involves, you know, by definition, decisions which have political implications, and secondly, money implications, 
the Deputy Mayor has to be involved in that, in that decision. I would want everybody to feel that they've had a full voice and full say. That sounds clumsy, but we're not going to go back out with the results of the um, evaluation to everybody and say, what do you think of that then? We will be making a decision fairly soon on the basis of the evaluation. Well, that's putting it fairly, and you know, I would like your job to try and make a decision on yeah. this. Uh, but our job is to make sure that that decision is objectively based sure. and evidence-led. And also, I think, from your point of view, also properly engages the public in what you're trying to do. Now, one of your key advocates should be the Safe Neighbour Boards okay. locally. Yeah. And, and they're not. And other comments I've had back from the Safe Neighbour Board is, well, the public aren't being asked at all what they think of, uh, about the process. Now, to my mind, you have a difficult decision to make. Uh, if it is to go ahead, you're going to have an even more difficult decision to sell to the public, particularly in the areas where this hasn't taken place yet and where, where there are concerns. For example, in my other borough, Barnet, they're not at all happy about, them, about the proposed merger with Brent, as, as Sophie knows. If the public aren't engaged, if the Safe Neighbourhoods aren't engaged properly, you're going to have a much more difficult job to sell this process. And, and that's what I'm concerned about. So I come back to where I started on this. We need to be satisfied that this is being done objectively with a proper assessment, evaluation, that reflects also experience on the ground. And one of my concerns is that you're not actually getting experience on the ground. You are from your own officers, as it were, but you're not from the people on the receiving end, from a better word, of the service, in terms of what people think that they're getting from the police service. So I would, ac I would accept much of what you say, or, but I would also add, <laughs> It's not as though we're policing in a vacuum. The borough commander is out there all the time talking to people. She's looking at her figures. She sees the victim satisfaction figures. She yep. sees the response time figures. She sees the complaints from police for, about police. She sees, she sees, and she talks to people. And she's talking to tons and tons and tons of people all the time. So it's not as though we've just done a sort of clinical experiment in a laboratory and are now doing our objective evaluation. We are going to do as an objective evaluation as we can, and we have taken people's views into account before during and at this point and we will continue to do so but I do accept that this sounds clumsy in relation to that particular group and I apologise. Okay, well, and, we, and it will be learning for the future. Can okay, I also well. add that you are just picking on the Safe Neighbourhood Board and you know, as, as uh, the Commissioner said it does sound clumsy in this, this particular instance but actually there has been a whole, it's not just that the borough commanders <coughs> in, the, in the pathfinders are out there talking to people, there's been a whole government structure around this and that includes the leaders of the councils and so they have been there and actually the evaluation has gone out to them and that's what they are now discussing in order for them to be there for them to be happy with the evaluation as well so there is there is actually a process around this so and a government structure around that so there's a so draft you, you, your is particular it issues on the smbs but actually there has been and it's been ongoing they, you know they've been meeting with the borough commander the council leaders and mark with simmons and with yourself so so is the draft evaluation already completed that's gone to the borough, borough leaders? Gone to the Pathfinder governance structures of which the, the yeah, borough leaders so, are in. So yeah. there is a draft? Yeah, draft. there is, yes, but we're right. not, we're not, the reason it's not being published is it hasn't been, um, you know, it hasn't been, it hasn't gone through this governance structure. If we published it without taking the views of, as you're very rightly saying, we need the views of those, those out there and the stakeholders, that's part of the governance structure mm -hmm. to break, <coughs> and we're waiting, we're, it's coming back and then we can actually go forward. But that is very, you know, I expect that by very soon. So, so as the Assembly Member for Camden, I'm not part of the... Well, you're not on the... You're, you haven't been attending the government structure. There's, there is a specific Well, I've been invited to. Well, <laughs> sorry we could just that. stop having this you know. discussion based on your you know. boroughs, Andrew, if well, you can. Well, I mean, this is an issue covered... If I may, you're, you've explored it very fully. This is an issue that I think we all have concerns around. Uh, we all have concerns at the Safe and Neighbour... Let me just Andrew, continue. The Safe Andrew, and Neighbour... Deputy Mayor... Let's just bring this, because I'm going to bring Lenin in a minute. I, I think it's an important issue. I, I know that you've been out talking to, to uh, council leaders, but the, the system is difficult for you. Uh, but all I would want you to take as a learning point is safe neighbour boards are, are a mechanism that, that I think are, are, are thorough, are rep in the main representative. And the observation is we think probably they've not been used to their best um, extent in this, in this consultation. I think, I think that's the observation I'm we're prepared making. prepared to um, take that one. Uh, yeah. I would say I have met with as many as I can of yeah, the Safe sure, Neighbour yeah. Board chairs recently and the PCCGs yeah, and uh, a yeah. whole variety of other people at all levels. Martin Hewitt, Mark Simmons, the Deputy, and of course on Sophie's yeah, side, sure. her and her staff have been meeting with countless different bodies yeah. and individuals, including Safe Neighbourhood Boards. Right, right. And you need to members of Parliament as well? Absolutely. Right. 
All right, Andrew, I think we've pursued this. One, one last question, if I may, on, on this issue of moving on from safe and neighbourhood board, uh, safe and neighbourhood boards and the, and the pathfinders specifically. Um, if we do go down to 26,900 officers because we don't get any more money from the government, where will those officers come from? Um, we have not got a settled plan for a 20, 26,900 officer uh, number. Um, and uh, we are, of course, at the moment uh, awaiting a statement from uh, the government. We're anticipating something before Christmas uh, in relation to our um, funding possibilities. Uh, and um, I suppose my quick way of saying that was if we had to go to 26,900, it would be extraordinarily difficult. Uh, and just we would, you know, of course, we've got plans to be more productive. Of course, we've got areas where we think we can reduce the demand. But in the context that we're currently in of increased terrorism threat, uh, increasing demand in sexual offences, cybercrime, human slavery, uh, I could go on, domestic abuse undoubtedly, going up, going up, to go to 26,900, and the budget that would sit below that would be extraordinarily difficult uh, and, to, to, and without us actually stopping doing some of the services we currently do. Fine. Well, I, I, mean, I saw that HMIC graded as good as planning for the future, so this is probably going to be it's going to test that, that goodness. Let, and, 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 and in the, fairness, the that, that is on the plans for the future. Yeah. So a number of you have questioned me in the past. We, yeah. This is the work we've yeah. been doing. How, so we've been very clear. We can do an operating model at 30,000, which mm -hmm. will be next year. We've got that. Yeah. It's ready to go. We've got all the work around it. As we go to tw if, if we go further down, as the Commissioner says, you have to drive service in a different way. So we drive money out the back office, which we've done. Mm -hmm. We sell a state, which we're doing, to, to, to liberate money to invest in better ways of working, but it will <coughs> be less officers on the streets right. of London. So, oh, last, know, last question then. Is it possible to, to provide a satisfactory response to a major incident if we go down to 26,900? Um, yes, I think it will be, uh, but it will cause us to work in a different way with the major incident, depending on the nature of it. Yeah. Uh, so we would almost certainly have to ask for assistance from other forces yeah. much, uh, sooner. In, uh, much sooner yeah. and in a way that we don't anticipate at the moment. Uh, but that's possible, uh, generally speaking, because we're all trained to the same level yeah. and have certain that's skills nice. that we all know about. Uh, it depends, of course, what's happening in the wider context. I understand that, but that's one way in which we would uh, mitigate that. And it would have a greater impact, rather obviously, on the rest of policing in the aftermath thereof. Um, so Tony was asking me about the impact of 200 officers on Grenfell. Another, uh, you know, series of major incidents at, at 26, 900 would, would have, um, you know, greater impact on other crime investigation, other public safety issues. Okay, right, now, thank you, Adi. Right, Lady. It, it does back the question, go back to the BCU mergers, because I, you know, um, I understand the context. I think we understand the context. I think it comes across in this exchange we've just had, it's a done deal, and the pathfinders, which we're grateful for MOPAC insisting upon, because actually the NPS were going to proceed, which I think, in an unsatisfactory way. What's clear from the pathfinders is you're making changes as you've gone along. Absolutely. Let's be honest That's about that. Well, fine. But can I just say, you've got roles, but we've got a role here. You're involving everybody else, except the, you know, we've got a statutory role, role, a role of oversight about MOPAC and about those issues. And you've got the operational role, and we're the missing point. We've had one briefing from Mark Simmons, which quite frankly was unsatisfactory. We've raised an old number of questions, and I've always prefaced, and I think I've said this, I've been honest, yeah. is that you don't seem to be able to answer the questions that I think is important before you <coughs> proceed. Now, some of the questions are important to us, and I think they would be important to you. So I think there are some issues here, and I think there's some unresolved issues. So, so as a, someone who's a bit, you know, is more about worried about how you're implementing it, rather than should sure. you do it or not do it, yeah. but it goes to the heart of how do you do and merge boroughs and still keep your localism, or are you going to go back in as you reduce numbers back into a defensive larder that you know best and everyone else is the suspect? That can't be the right way about no. partnership policing. So where does the partnership bit fit in? What's the lessons learned around that? The different practices that exist within borough policing from borough to borough, yeah. what are you doing about raising the standard up yeah. rather than the raising the standard down? Yeah. How are you going <coughs> to cope with local authority different practice 
which is, exist. I can see that in the three boroughs that are going to be merged with me on different issues. Of course, let's talk about some of the issues. So, in partnership working, we need to have an honest debate about tenure working, uh, tenure, right? Is the new, let's call it the new borough commander, doing a commander type role, an area commander role? Are they going to be there or are they going to disappear on study leave? Because they're actually not providing leadership and we need to focus on the superintendents. If that's the case, then I need to get a tenure agreement with you that you're not doing this as some study a study trip that somehow this is a part-time job mm. and you're just doing that to mm. be there we need to understand that you're building effective partnership working in a reduced context both for local authorities and yourself about crime issues so what's the core numbers we're still waiting to hear what's the core numbers of these new borough commands maybe that's not important in this brave world for me i think core numbers is what makes up the core team that goes into it and i think Commissioner, you outlined what that looks like. It would be nice to see what those core numbers, what's the expectation from those boroughs in a merged borough command can expect in terms of the numbers they're going to get, because I think that's important about the capacity and the delivery at local level. Um, you know, we could go back to, within this, uh, the whole issue about the decentralisation nature of the Met. Are these BCU commanders really got the authority to do X, Y, Z? Or are we going to still be to working in silos? These are issues that we need to work through. On the superintendents, is it three or is it four? Craig Mackey, I asked you a question. Crime yeah. analysis, one of those people, early yeah. cuts, went out the door. Are they back in? Are you going to create new posts of crime analysis? Or does new technology work out for that? These are basic issues around it. And actually, you know, I feel like we're not being treated the same as the others in terms of as you go through and make those brave decisions. So, where I'm sitting, I'm, I'm, I'm quite, you know, I'm not naive. I think this is the way it's going. Fine. If that's the choice you're going to do, I think we need assurances about the implementation of it. We need to understand how you're going to level up the quality. I think there could be some real gains here. I, you know, I take it around the missing person bit, the, you know, the DV Thank bit God and all the rest yeah. of it. But unless there's some performance, but if we're just going to get more of the same, but just with larger units, that can't be right. I don't expect you to answer that, because what I think, right, we'll be looking forward to your reports. And personally, I have told Martin Hewitt and Mark Simons when I met him in the corridor, unless you can answer me questions, then I'm not going to be supporting this. Because I expect them to be seen and addressed in a future report, along with many other issues. The list can go on and on. I don't think this has been the Met at its best in terms of the implementation of these issues. I think you can do a better job. These are the reasons why we're raising these questions, because actually I think you can do a better job around it. We had a long time. This issue came up in Boris Johnson's regime. This is not something that's just new. You've had a number of years to do this. And we're still asking some basic questions. I shouldn't be in that position. And sorry for being like this, but that's where I am. And I'm one of your best supporters, really, about what you need to do and how you need to do it. Like and actually I feel a bit uncomfortable still. Now, I take your reassurance at this point, but, you know, I do feel, and I don't want to be prissy about it, because I'm not, but we've got some statutory oversight as well, and we're not including in that debate at any level. I don't think that's right. I don't think that's right. This could be construed as being part of that debate. I think it's, we're worth a little bit more. In to give, that. If I may, to give a cross-party <laughs> agreement... Which I, which I sense is falling out of my, my, my life here. Out. <laughs> we're, we're, I'm, I'm pretty much endorsing... Uh, I mean, there's more comments and points there than several questions, I think. But I think the, the <coughs> point around involvement in this building, in these members, this committee and the board of members, it, has, been, has been lacking. I think that point needs to be reinforced. Okay. And there's a lot of details missing. And when, we, when we're out there talking to, to colleagues and other, other people in the boroughs, often the questions are simple questions that people ask is what about the numbers what about the new wall boundaries what about that and these questions and we don't know the answer to that and we want to be out there being advocates and we don't have the tools sometimes to be to be advocates so i want to really just to come out on, on support you might you might wish to let me just yeah. let me just yeah. you might wish to comment on some of the things that that, that have been saying you may not be able to answer all of them you may want to write to us but we could you answer. might do, you might yeah. want to respond briefly 
to a degree. I was just going to respond in terms of Andrew and Len and yourself in terms of what you're saying about the involvement of assemblymen. I'd have to go back and I will go back and check the transcript of last time because I'm, if I didn't, I should have, and it was the intention that when we had the evaluation report that leaders and through the governance structure had um, you could come back, that we would come and brief you about it and take your, you know, and that's the intention and absolute commitment to make that happen. Whether that's before Christmas, which would be next week, or really early in the new year, I don't know, because we are still, there's still that work that it needs to be finished. Okay. You, so. said, you certainly said you briefed me once it was out, but my concern is, and I find it rather insulting actually, that you've got a draft report that you're discussing with lots of other people, you're not prepared to share with us right in draft. That, well, I think it's only right that the, those who, the, the governance structure has the opportunity to comment on it before it goes elsewhere. Because if we then produced, you know, came to you to talk about a report that hadn't actually gone through the governance structure and it changed, you would rightly feel, well, what's going on? I mean, I'm not, sorry no, if you no, think that's Andrew, the wrong way. It's not, it's not, it's not an either or. Andrew, well, please. Yeah, Continue. I, think, I, think it, I think it's right that it goes through the governance structure and after the governance structure has had a look at it and has okay. commented on it, that that, that, okay. pr that project comes to you and that was, the I thought, the commitment that I made last time and is certainly the commitment that I'm making now. Yeah, I mean, what you, you, know, you must appreciate that around, around yeah. this horseshoe you have people with considerable experience, MPA, ex-MPA colleagues and, and others, who, who probably have quite an advanced view of, of, of all things met uh, and, and want to be supportive and, and need to be kept in the picture. Jane, you wanted a, I think you wanted to yeah, comment. Yeah, it was just the comment really that as an elected assembly member representing two boroughs, I previously have always been, or in Maine, if there's been a major issue, a major operation on my borough or something like this happening, I would have the courtesy of a, a call from my borough commander and to be involved with those decision makings, just as an, and my local MPs. Would. That has not happened. It's not just the last two years, it's been the, the last three or four years. Um, and I wish that asked for that respect to be returned, really. If <coughs> local borough commanders have something important they're informing the MPs about, to actually also inform the local assembly member. I think there's a bit of a mis misunderstanding there, and I'm not, I'm not being defensive about this at all. I'm hearing what you're saying. We need you as advocates. Wherever we go forward, we need you to understand, we need you to feel that we are allowing you to discharge your, your statutory function. Absolutely. <coughs> but I'm not saying that MPs have had preferential briefings over any of you. They haven't. Yeah, but all of us have been talking to thousands of people about these, or hundreds of people, about these issues for many months, including at every one of these committees. And we have offered briefings, and we will continue to offer briefings, of course. And so, obviously, if the decision is to go ahead, I would absolutely expect local borough commanders to be in touch with a whole variety of people, including absolutely, definitely, assembly members, to start fleshing out what it might begin to look like. Numbers is difficult, obviously, because we don't know what the budget settlement is. It's coming quite late. Um, so if we were to put into the public domain hypothetical numbers right now, when we haven't even finished the evaluation, as you say, we've been changing the model as we've gone. We've learnt some hard lessons. We've been surprised at how well some things have gone, and we've been surprised at how, how hard some things have been. So the model has been changing as it's gone forward. If we make the decision to go f further forward, it will be slightly different again. So it's very, it is very hard. And again, if I might say, as a humble operational cop, it's very hard in an extremely politicised atmosphere to be able to have completely open discussions with everybody about everything without things being really put off track. And you will understand that. I, we get that. Unmet, did you want to come in on the subject? Same subject? Uh, uh, no, it's a slightly different subject. But can I just say about BCUs? Um, uh, 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 the leadership of Barker and Dagnum had a meeting with um, BSC Simmons last week, and I think a number of serious issues were raised. And can I just echo the comments made by Assemblyman Dismore about the involvement of CFA neighborhood boards, the total disillusionment of the chair, Steve Thompson, um, lack of attendance at statutory bodies like the Health and Wellbeing Board, uh, mm -hmm. uh, amongst other things. So it is a concern not just in Camden and Barnet, but also Commissioner uh, in, in the East area as well. Perhaps just to take one, one of your several points, Lennon, we should speak outside and afterwards, and we're happy to do briefings, of course we are. Um, I, do, I have always seen that the most um, contested area will be the uh, 
in prospect, at least, the relationships and how partnerships, partnership working will really work. Uh, and again, I think we've learned some lessons during the um, Pathfinders, which is why they now have extra superintendents Resilience. over the number yeah. they started with. And that is primarily to pay attention to the partnership issues. Um, people are very used to the current structure. It's been borough-based policing, you were there, Len, when it was invented in 2000, 2001. It's been very successful in many respects, and one of the ways in which it has been successful has been having that one person talking to a chief executive and a leader within a borough, of course, at least in theory. I don't want to be trivial, but just to lighten the atmosphere, if I might, just for a second, just to say, I think in my history I've only ever met one leader who didn't think their borough commander was absolutely brilliant. I can tell you they weren't all absolutely brilliant. People get used to that very, very, very one close on relationship one-on-one, -on -one, and I know this is going to be a difficult change to go through, assuming we do, and we have to really pay attention to it. But out of the Pathfinders now, there are lots of very positive relationships yeah. coming, and if we, when we come to the evaluation, you will see on, the, on safeguarding, for example, there are lots and lots of advantages yeah. in this way of working in terms of partnership, as I think you would have predicted. Umesh, again. Chair, before we go to the next section, uh, Commissioner, uh, can I just ask you a question about crime figures and crime levels? Um, you, Assembly Member Discman asked you about your response to major incidents. Can I actually ask you about um, everyday crime, and in particular, what I would say are very depressing figures that came out uh, in Mopex Quarter 2 performance report. Uh, crime in many categories has gone up. Homicide, 27%. Serious youth violence, 19%. Knife crime, and I think the latest knife crime-related murder was in Pinner last week. And from memory, that was the 25th knife-related uh, murder that we've had in London this yeah. year, on average two a month. Um, knife crime up 31.3%. Uh, I could go on and on. Uh, in light of everything we've heard this morning, use of resources, the mayor's statement about fa falling police numbers, planning for the future, HMIC report about you requiring improvement in efficiency with which you keep people in London safe and reduce crime. What do these figures, what message, um, uh, what, what do these figures say about how safe we are in London, one? Two, what are you doing about it? What is your message to Londoners for 2018? So, when I arrived in April, I said my overriding priority was violence. That remains the same. It is. I felt then that the violence, and you've mentioned several violence offences, yeah. uh, was at much higher levels than I would like and had been going up very significantly for the last about year. That rise has continued in a way that I find very concerning. However, there are many categories in which it, I believe it is now stabilised or begun to come down. And I'm pleased by that. And you're very familiar uh, with, for example, Operation Scepter, some mm. of our anti-gang work, various other things which have had a big impact on, for example, moped-enabled crime and uh, knife-enabled crime. It is still uh, high, much higher than I would like. It is proving difficult with our already reduced police numbers to be as proactive as we would like. Uh, and we are having to make some hard decisions to get people out onto the streets to bear down on those forms of violent crime that you're talking about. However, in terms of crime overall, I would say that London is in fact uh, not out of step with other cities, including in the UK and indeed across the Western world. So that trend of reduction in crime for five years and then going back up for about the last 18 months is similar, for example, in the United States, across Europe. This is a Western sort of uh, world phenomenon at the moment, which many people are, are struggling with. I am, of course, concerned, and I've been very clear, I think we are a stretched police service, but we are prioritising violence, and we're prioritising bearing down on violence, particularly as it impacts on our young people, and we are having quite a lot of success with that. And my message for 2018 is we will be doing very much more of some of the same tactics and also seeing what else we can do to bear down on, on violent crime, knife and able crime in particular. Okay, thank you. Before we move on to the next section, just for um, <coughs> sake, sake of balance, uh, Craig, you talked about your modelling for different scenarios around yes. sa savings cuts. I mean, that modelling would include savings that are not necessarily predicated around reduction in police numbers? 
Yes, I, I mean, you, yeah, as an organisation shrinks in size, you can make savings in other areas, such as simple things like all your contracts, your volumes change, and you make savings. So, no, we absolutely look at that, and part of the work we do throughout the year is looking at areas to make... But, you know, uh, 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 Len raised an important point with me. You know, people want analysts back. Well, you can have analysts back, <coughs> what are you going to give up? Um, you know, it's not, it, this, is a, this is a constrained environment in which to do it. So we're having to make far more difficult and testing choices as we, we decide where to put money. But it, no, it's not as simple as you pull one handle and it just means everything comes down. But there is a limit. Mm. You know, you'll remember some of the success we've talked about. We've taken 600 million without having to go into the front line. That is completely out of kilter with what's happened in the rest of the country. Okay. So we took an awful lot of savings in back and middle office. Indeed. And you'll know when you look at police staff numbers, PCSO numbers, that's why the huge fall has come. So a lot of focus on London that we've not dropped officer numbers up to now, mm. but we have lost entirely, and we've lost 9% of our paid workforce. Yeah. That's entirely in line with the national statistics. Ours has come from police staff and PCSOs. Um, so there is a limit. You can't, you know, I'm not going to mislead you. You can't find hundreds of millions more. Yeah, no, you absolutely. can find fives and tens here and there, which is a lot of money, but not in the context of some of the gaps we've got to Thank you. I, I just wanted to draw that, that context out before we, we move on. Now, we, are, we have got quite a lot of questions to cover, and we are, haven't got an immense amount of time. So if we could kind of move it on relatively uh, swiftly but appropriately. So the next section uh, is around women offenders. Um, the committee's done some work around this and have taken evidence for some, for some witnesses. And we've got some questions here uh, relating to that work uh, for colleagues. I think, Sean, do you want to Yeah, that's on okay. That? Um, <clears throat> I just wanted to add one more thing on the BCU's issue. I think we could all, um, <laughs> we could all do eight minutes on this if, we, if you wanted us to. Um, but um, I think you've mainly heard from, from Labour members um, so far. And I think... Just from my point of view, um, as a ward councillor in one of the boroughs, um, I definitely feel like the grassroots people on the streets, the people who attend the local uh, ward panel meetings are not being particularly engaged in, in evaluating this yet. Um, and from a political point of view, I do think you need, to, you need to watch who you're discussing things with when you do give briefings to politicians, because I think Assemblymember Pigeon asked um, a written question about the consultation that was done before the police, uh, the public access and engagement strategy, and all the pre-launch consultation events were and meetings were with Labour people, and I think that is a bit of a worry from from my point of view. So I just wanted to add that in. Point made. Thank you. Uh, so it's not a question. Um, I do have questions on uh, women offenders. Um, we have um, been investigating this, and we've held a, an evidence meeting with practitioners. Um, and others who support women offenders, uh, women in the crim criminal justice system. Uh, and the reason we're doing it is because it's 10 years since the Causton report. Um, we wanted to see how things were going um, in terms of the recommendations that the re that report made. And also there's huge relevance to the fact that Holloway Prison has recently closed um, in London and that seems to have left some gaps. And we heard some testimony also in private from uh, women offenders themselves about their experiences. Um, so we, we have some questions to, to follow up on that, really. Um, there seems to be some concerns that women are not potentially being diverted away from the criminal justice system, that a lot of short sentences seem to be causing a lot of harm, and the fact that the prisons are not in London any longer seems to be causing a lot of uh, problems for <coughs> support services as well as obviously the families of, of women in prison uh, for those short times. So I mean my questions, I mean the first question is really to uh, the Met because one of the things that we heard particularly from the women themselves um, was that police officers are not, don't seem to be particularly sympathetic to um, confounding circumstances and other needs that, of, uh, that women might have. And I think that's one of the things that the police are looking at doing better in, um, is identifying when there might be needs for other services. We heard from one woman who came to speak to us um, who was clearly having mental health problems while she was in custody. Um, she wasn't eventually charged or kept in. And when she was released, just sent out without any reference to any further service she might need. Um, so. Well, the question is really to the Matt. Um, do you are you trained your training your officers up in this, um, helping women to access other services they might need when they come into contact with the police? Um, 
I'll start by saying I go back even further than Causton, because I was on the Fawcett Commission, which Jean Causton was on, and it, and it was one of the things that led to the Causton um, work. And um, I am um, probably slightly out of date, but reasonably familiar with a lot of the issues, and I am very concerned that we do our bit here. Uh, and I think um, often female offenders uh, will be um, signposted, let's say, if they come into custody, uh, through a variety of different methods. So in the event that they are um, themselves, which is rare but not un unheard of, a domestic violence offender, then there is a whole range of specialist signposting that should be given to them. If they are in a gang, again, there will be uh, signposting and that sort of diversionary efforts made with them. If they have drug or alcohol abuse <laughs> issues or they clearly have mental health issues in custody, then again, we have specialist workers, as you know, in custody to assist us. Not everywhere all of the time, but we have lots. So this is not always primarily uh, looked at or presenting as a gender-based issue, of course, but doesn't mean that we're not um, alert to, or should not be alert to vulnerabilities. Of course we are, and sometimes those are different, you know, on the basis of, of gender. Um, I think that the professionalization of custody through the Met Detention Center has been a real positive uh, thing here uh, because it does allow for you know really centrally controlled uh, proper training of individuals who are working with people in our custody uh, areas. Um, I think there is further to go. I'd be really interested to see more of the evidence that you have um, gleaned and we are of course working with MOPAC on a number of um, programs going forward where we think we, there is room for us to work more effectively, and we'll hear about this in a second, no doubt, to work more effectively to divert uh, women uh, who are coming into first or second or early contact with the criminal justice system away from uh, the courts and prisons, and we're, we're really determined to do that. I think July 18 will be um, unveiling quite a big, it's likely to go ahead in July 18, quite a big joint project with, with MOPAC uh, in relation to this. Um, that's useful to hear. In terms of making improvements, how, you, how do you monitor how effectively uh, women or people in general who need specialist services are, are given those services? Is there, a, is there a method you use to track that? Well, we can monitor the referral. Of course, we've got no way of knowing if there's a follow-up, um, short of going back and finding that person and saying, did the services pick up with you? So we can monitor referral numbers for services, and some of that's on our, our dashboard for custody. Um, but it's very hard for us to follow up and uh, work out the completion of the service delivery. Do you make any attempt to record when you when you fail to refer people? I know that's a difficult thing to, to look at, but do you follow up with people ever and say, do you feel like you should have been referred to an, another service? No, we, we uh, other, other than, um, no, that's, that's untrue. So you might pick that up if someone was also a victim as well and they were surveyed as part of the, the, the ongoing victim work that goes on, but we don't. We don't survey routinely people leaving custody and say, were the services you should have had. Okay, well, maybe we should think about that. Um, just also a practical question to do with Holloway Prison. Um, is there, are there any practical problems that the police have with the fact that the, the prison's been, been closed? Does it, does it impact on you at all? Um, I mean, the, 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 the truth is that uh, we, sadly, in London, supply prisoners all over the country in very large numbers. So I think we have, if I'm right, less than 10% of the prisons are in London and 25% of the offenders in the prison population, something like that, are London-based people. So men and women alike, if we need to go and re-interview for something, if, we, if they are dangerous and we want to be really sure that we are being able to ma work with others to manage their re-entry into society, uh, if we're trying to manage risk around sex offenders or violent offenders, whatever, that is on occasion more challenging uh, if we fear they're a gang member. It's more challenging when officers have to go up the country. <laughs> that would be the same for men and women alike. But obviously, because there are relatively so few women offenders in the prison system, more than you and probably I would like, but there's so few, actually it means it's more, it's more travelling on each occasion. Um, I'm not aware of any other sort of specific uh, challenges that have come from the closure of Holloway. Okay, and, and what's your view on replacement of prison with women's centres as a more holistic way of dealing with women's centres. Well, I'm, I'm not experts, but I do think that um, 
you know, the, 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 the data is strong, isn't it, that, that women at the moment are much more likely to be in prison for short sentences, and most of the data is strong that short sentences aren't ideal for um, sort of rehabilitation <laughs> and people being able to make a change in their life. Um, and therefore, um, whatever some of the newspapers want to, may have wanted to report me as saying in the part, recent past, I am completely in favour of things which are more effective, as everybody is in the system, I imagine, more effective than prison. If we, can, if we can get them going and access them and keep people away from prison, that's a good thing, if it reduces reoffending. Okay, thank you. I think you uh, Jane? Thank you. Can I ask about the diversion? And I'm glad you've said that we need to try and encourage more women not to enter the criminal justice system. So the question is to both the Commission and to the Deputy Mayor. Um, I think you're looking at a police-led triage system to try and divert women from the criminal justice system. Can I ask, what, can you tell us a little bit more where you're at with this pilot and perhaps what the outcomes you would want to see from it? I, 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 Commissioner's already talked about it. We are developing it. Mm. It's, um, it's based on the very, very small pilots that took, part in, took place in the Triborough and Lambeth, which were just such small numbers that we needed to do it on a larger scale. We're hoping that by the summer of 2018 it'll be ready to be up and running. Um, the outcomes is to try to divert those women who are being, you know, divert them away from cut the criminal justice system in order for that to be effective around reoffending and rehabilitation because that is absolutely the, where we're trying to get to that if they you know obviously it's where there is low risk or very minimal risk and it's for very you know certain types of offenses but it is around diverting them away from the criminal justice system and it is really is about reoffending and how we can pick up their needs through, through, for example, attendance at women's centres, uh, pick up their needs and pick up some of the some of the needs which aren't, aren't you know, we have already we are already funding, uh, putting half a million pounds into a into a scheme in ten boroughs around the additional needs that women have um, can have you know some of this counts, trauma counselling as well as other things financial support, so that we hope that that pilot will be up and running and it will be up and running by the summer. It's been worked on at the moment. Okay, so the triage system should be up and running um, um, in the summer. And do you know where you're, where you're going to pilot that yet? Which part of London? It's across, it's across the net. It, it is. It's yeah, I don't think it's net. every borough, though. No. It's it, no um, I think at the moment. <laughs> so I double checked this morning. <laughs> sorry, <laughs> sorry, <laughs> Deputy Mayor. Yeah. It's not it's every <laughs> borough. We anticipate um, uh, eight or twelve boroughs in the first, in the very first phase, right. and then we'll start to yeah. roll out to the others. And we'll start, we are intending at the moment to start with those that are, um, have the highest volumes of people yeah. for whom this out-of-court disposal system would be most yeah. suitable. Um, I checked and was not able to get this morning the final uh, names, and obviously it depends on getting partners set settled in those areas as well. Okay, thank you. I think it would be useful if you could write to us for sure. with a bit more yeah. details about that, and particularly about the partners you need to engage and what your expected outcomes yeah. Um, would be. But on the enhanced service for female offenders across the 10 boroughs, which I think is great work, mm -hmm. but obviously there are 32 boroughs. Um, what are you looking at in trying to have enhanced services throughout the whole of London? Yeah. I mean, that the um, you're right, it is 10 boroughs. Um, obviously, there's 32 boroughs in London, so it's only small, you know, it's a third of the London that's been covered by that. Some of the early signs of that have been quite, have been really encouraging in terms of the numbers actually being referred into the service and some of the, there's positive signs of um, people, uh, women talking about increasing self-confidence, reporting improved physical and mental health, as well as, you know, better control over their finances. So it, it's really encouraging. What are we doing to try to make sure that's across London? We're talking to the Ministry of Justice about that at the moment because some of this does just come down to investment and the need for investment in London in terms of some of the you know, women's centres. London has a paucity of women's centres. The two that are in London are fantastic. I visited one of them doing fantastic work, spoken to a woman offender there, struggling with drug dependency, struggling with childcare, housing, all the things that you would, could imagine come with complex needs. But it is, you know, the rest of London, there is a paucity. We're having that discussion with the Ministry of Justice at the moment about investment. And we are prepared to put our, you know, some MOPAT money in. But it is, we need, we need that investment. 
We're also having a discussion with the Ministry of Justice around, um, I see this as part of the devolution uh, package. My next question, <laughs> yes. <laughs> it is part of the devolution package around actually having a really, and we are uh, discussing at the moment, that focus on female offending as a cohort, as we talked about in the police and crime plan because um, it is around the, that link up regionally of all the services and we feel that that can be done in a very you know in a much better way through proper, you know through a good devolution package and we're having that discussion around a memorandum of understanding at the moment and the ministers obviously are engaging with that do you have any time scales as to when devolution may take place I think the time scale is around signing a memorandum of understanding and that really is around the roadmap to devolution. Um, some, of, some of it is also around a discussion around investment and I think on female offending it is about devolution as well as investment. Can't get away from the fact that we London has a paucity of women's centres compared to the need and the demand. Already mentioned Holloway closing. I, I mean, you may not have had the um, reported impact of the police, but it certainly has had an impact on the women. I mean, the women, are, you know, I know you weren't asked yeah. that. Yeah. <laughs> but, yeah. but um, you know, the women have been sent outside London. I visited Bronzefield, uh, which yeah. is where women who would have been in Holloway are now at Bronzefield. They're all outside London. And the impact that has on yeah. family life, yes, um, yes. children visiting, but also the impact it has on the probation services and all those professional yes. services that they need to connect with they have to go outside London and that is not working and it's not working properly. So we've been lobbying around ensuring that through the sale of the site um, at Holloway, that there, and we've written around this as well, that there is a, you know, a long-term legacy for women <coughs> in that area from the, sale of the, from, that, from the sale of the site. Haven't yet made headway on that, but that's certainly something that we think should happen there as, as to the Prison Reform Trust. Um, but we'll have to wait and see. Those are discussions we're having the with the Ministry of Justice as well. Good. And if that works and the investment is there, would that enable you <coughs> to and provide more specialist provision across London? I mean, it depends on the scale of the investment. Yeah. Um, we want to. We the the path we want to go down and that we set out in the Police and Crime Plan was that cohort of female offenders who are. You know, there, will, there, are, there will be and there are female offenders who should be in prison because they are at a risk, but there are you know, a substantial number of female women who shouldn't be in prison and would have their needs and their ability and actually the evidence of what works in terms of ensuring that they don't commit further crimes. Absolutely, we want to have that provision. It's provision around domestic violence and sexual abuse services because a huge proportion of women that are in prison are victims of domestic abuse, have been victims of sexual violence or sexual abuse, and how do we work to ensure that you deal with those issues and that helps them not re-offend. But it depends, on the, it's, it depends on the level of investment because London, at the moment, as I've said before, doesn't have enough and it is really quite sparse. We'll have to see what investment there is, if it, some, you know, that, that, in terms of how how much you can actually gear up that. I don't feel confident that that will gear up for the whole of London. We may be able to gear up in parts of London. Peter, well, thank you. Uh, morning, Commissioner. Good morning. Um, just to follow on from the point about trying to keep women out of the criminal justice mm -hmm. system, uh, when we took our evidence last time, uh, it seemed to emerge that in fact the main reason women end up in the criminal justice system is non-payment of the TV license fee, uh, which uh, is not to trivialise, it's extraordinary. And I wondered, I mean, at what point, when you're talking about that, do you become involved or do you ever become involved in it? We don't enforce that. <laughs> no, no, reminded no. Me. I mean, <laughs> people aren't being dragged out of their homes or anything, are they? <laughs> That's, so if there's a warrant issued for someone, we may find that when we're yeah. talking to someone in inquiry. But, but the enforcement around TV licensing is not a routine part of our role. No, but it's just something like 38% of women. I, no, I no, understand. And it's the, and the a whole, huge amount. Yeah. You know, I just yeah. wonder it would be an enormous drain on your time if, if you were involved or had to be in any way. No. Uh, okay, thank you. Yeah, thank, you thank you for that. Thank you for raising that. Um, right, our penultimate subject is uh, child protection. Um, clearly, we'll be aware of the report in November 16 around the financial deficiencies, HMIC, uh, publishing quarterly reports, and we heard that the latest one, only November, uh, that the HMIC were pleased um, with the progress in numerous areas, but were still concerned um, about the progress made, and we heard 
of examples um, that will be disturbing. Uh, so we have some questions around that. I think, Caroline, you're happy to lead on that. Thank you very much indeed. Um, actually, the November 17 wasn't, uh, I think, as rosy a picture, perhaps, as, as the Chair is mentioning, when it found, it stated that 93% of cases they looked at showed policing practice that either needed improvement or was inadequate. Mm. And it also found little evidence of senior leaders in the MPS using information to change its operational practices sufficiently. So I think a year on, I'm assuming this wasn't comfortable reading, but I'm wondering first on the Met, how you reacted to this and um, your views on the work in this area. So I think um, it's not very comfortable reading. I also think that we will probably have some uncomfortable reading for some considerable period of time to come. Um, some of the uh, process that is being sought is not, of course, unimportant, but is very hard to reach a really consistent standard on in an organisation as disparate as ours, working in a city as diverse as ours in the demands uh, that we have. And I don't want to pretend, and I don't think anybody ever did, that we would be able to get from the very um, uh, negative report place uh, to a really good place in a matter of months. Um, and when I talk to my uh, professionals, they do believe uh, that this will, as I've been discussing with Sophie um, just in the last couple of weeks, and we regularly discuss, take you know a considerable period of time to turn the Met to a place which is actually performing in this in this area to the level that the HMI is asking for in all these different categories. However, I wouldn't want you to think that that meant that the 93% figure are all um, children put at risk. They're not. Far from it, actually. And in many of the categories, the process isn't perfect, but there's either been a very good end result or the process isn't perfect, but the children are not being put at extra risk because of that. It's just that it, it isn't the way we have said it will be, which should be the policy says or whatever. But this is a uh, huge task and um, you know, involves, as, as the report indicated, uh, many changes that we have made and we've made very boldly and very strongly in terms of investment, in terms of leadership, in terms of being really clear about accountability, in terms of a programme of, imp of improvement. To turn that into, you know, consistent, much better output and outcome is going to take uh, quite a while. It's a year on from the yeah, first is, report, which is, is yeah. considerable time. It's not months. And no. whilst I accept what you, you're saying, you will have looked at some of these files. There are case studies in this, and I'm going to read them out today. We read them out at the last meeting that are appalling that things are being allowed to happen and not being followed up when they've been flagged that are putting children at risk. So it's what um, measures are um, you putting in place? Are you putting additional resourcing into this air? What are you doing to try to turn this ship round as quickly as you can? So I've mentioned um, the leadership. I've mentioned the governance. I've mentioned uh, the programmatic approach. I should also have mentioned that we now have um, a very strong training function. We have a very strong uh, our own audit function, which is actually harsher in its findings yes, than the, the HMI. Um, yeah. So they are yeah. everywhere. We're learning all the time as they go around ab uh, about what the challenges are. Um, and uh, we absolutely are putting more resources into this area. Uh, and if we go to um, the uh, um, borough uh, sort of streamlining local policing model in the format as has been referred to as borough mergers, that will strengthen our ability in this area, I believe, very considerably. And that's one of the reasons why we may very well end up there, because it puts a greater resilience and density and higher level of skill in uh, each area, each two or three borough area, than can possibly be achieved at the moment. And it makes consistency of practice much easier to achieve, and it allows us to spread the word across the relevant people much faster. But yes, there's more resource going in. And that, of course, is one of the things that is putting a strain on the other side of the house. You, know, you can't do anything inevitably. So more resource moving more officers in. Absolutely. Um, I, I realise and I'll Proportionately, so yeah. your discussion earlier, but back in 2014, um, in fact, you were the lead then, um, we did a report on safeguarding children, and we actually flagged the issue of whether you somehow need to overstaff this area because yes. 
you know, huge numbers of women who work in here on maternity yeah. leave and so on. So you are always well below we, yeah. what, what, what resource you should have. Yes. And I don't know whether there's any thinking that's been done around that. Yes, well, we, we have, um, as you know, a shortage in uh, detective uh, ability overall, but we have very much prioritised this area since 2014 <laughs> as an area to put uh, detective skills into. And we're continuing to do that. So the act actual number of vacancies, complete vacancies, is very much lower than it was in 2014 proportionately. Uh, and we will continue to prioritise this as an area for uh, skilled people to, to go to. And we have begun to be able to reduce their workloads, uh, particularly again in the Pathfinder sites, by some of the efforts that we may be making. Because as you know, some of them were carrying very heavy workloads, which the HMI weren't mm. comfortable with, and nor were they. So we're beginning to do that as well in, in, the, speci in the separate specialist offices. Um, but, uh, yeah, it, it's, it remains a more, um, uh, you know, there are more women in that area, and therefore there are more people by definition on maternity leave than there would be in some other areas. Yeah. Huge challenge in that area. Um, how do you balance um, the issue between tackling violent crime committed by children and young people and on the other side, action to protect and safeguard children in London. And particularly some of it's the attitude. And one thing that was flagged up, just a quote in the HMIC report, they state, this was about missing children, and my colleague's going to come on to that in a minute, but um, we're talking about them, it's what they always do. So completely missing the point why they might be going missing and what they're caught up in, and that they can be a victim as well as perhaps a perpetrator. So how do you get that balance right and the sort of attitude as well uh, of your officers? So this, I, I would say, is one of the things that I've seen change uh, most dramatically in the time that I was out, actually. So I was away from the Met, as you know, for over two years. And I think it is changing very fast. Um, uh, and, of course, the demand in this area is going up very fast as well. <laughs> That's mostly about our understanding. So um, within ch children who may present as offenders, you know, we will have people and do have people who've been trafficked. We wouldn't have recognised that. None of us would. No five, ten years ago probably. Um, we absolutely have people who are, uh, young people who are being exploited in various different ways and we have people who are vulnerable in various different ways and I think the officers are getting better and better and better at this. Now that is converting of course into a massive increase in demand for us uh, as you know and it was one of the things that the HMI with the other hand did yeah. um, in the efficiency report a compliment us on yeah. is our understanding of this sort of hidden demand yeah. and our desire to seek it out, pull it out yeah. and deal with it. So to get to the kind of practical, if you look at Trident, for example, you know, it's always been seen as a sort of um, crime-busting function, primarily, with some preventative work going on in communities as well. You know, the Trident officers are all fully trained in child sexual exploitation, they're fully trained in the human trafficking, modern slavery laws, and they are using that all the time. County lines, yeah. the phrase that is used for mostly, but not entirely, young people, sometimes vulnerable older people, being sent by gang leaders, for want of a better word, up to, to other parts of the country with drugs or money or guns or whatever. You know, Trident are dealing with that with colleagues across the country and they're looking at it primarily through the lens of the vulnerability of the person who is, yes, they're committing a crime, but they've been forced to in some way or other, or they're vulnerable. And I think that's a, you know, I think we should be proud of that. It's a big change. We've just got a conviction in the last um, a couple of weeks by Trident in relation to uh, trafficking. And I anticipate many more. We've got some big trials coming in the new year, actually, in relation to that. So that would be uh, one example. And the officers are constant being <coughs> missing people. And Craig will tell me the numbers. Huge increase in, in missing people reports. Lots of those are young people. Um, not all of them are, I'm sure, debriefed quite as, as, as thoroughly as you would like. And I can't guarantee that all of them are seen for, as, as, as it were, what they may be or indeed what hindsight will show they were. Mm -hmm. But it is difficult. I'm sure, I mean, Caroline, you've been around us for long mm -hmm. enough to know. <laughs> Young people who go repeatedly missing, absolutely, there's very likely to be some, maybe domestic abuse at home, sexual abuse perhaps. They may be being exploited. There may be drug and alcohol problems. There may be all sorts of things going on. But to the busy officer on the shift, they don't want to speak to them. They haven't got any time for the police and they want to go and do their thing, and you've come along and collected them and said, right, we're going back here. You know, it's not always, it's not a, <laughs> it's not easy, it's not a perfect environment. 
and I am actually, frankly, concerned about the potential if if we don't lead our if I don't lead my organisation effectively through this increase in demand, I will have officers who see their many officers who see their only role as kind of being in loco parentis, as opposed to bringing people to justice, which actually is our USP. Thank, thank you for that. Um, can I move on to um, the Deputy Mayor? Um, what was your reaction to the latest HMIC report? How are you overseeing the Met's response in this area of child protection? So when the, uh, the original report was published, we set up a steering group to oversee um, improvements in, in the Met. And that steering group has, obviously, Metropolitan Police on it and Martin Hewitt. Um, uh, assistant Commissioner, and that, that was, you know, as a response to the report around, I think there's been significant improvement in terms of the leadership and the structures <coughs> and the governance around child protection and, um, and arising from this report. Um, we've, um, as well on that group, is the National College of Policing in, in order to bring through, bring in um, outside police expertise and the, um, and the NPC. Um, that's the yeah, College of Policing. Um, who are the other people? Sorry. Mm -hmm. got, uh, the NPCC lead, the National the NPCC lead. NPCC, yeah. as well as the National College of yeah. Policing. Right. Sorry. <laughs> Getting oh, my, okay. my organisation. There's too many acronyms. Yeah. Too yeah. many acronyms. Yeah. I've just said that. Um, so they're there as to bring in that expertise and ability to think about, well, what are other forces doing? And I think that was really important. So there's that oversight model. I mean, in terms of that report, it was disappointing. Um, it was. It had some good things in it in terms of uh, looking at the governance structures, the leadership, the campaign around spot it to stop it, um, and the, the you know the the real focus on training, real focus on trying to change that culture that you've picked up in in that case study. It was disappointing, but we know it is going to take time. The question for me is, how do we assess whether it's moving quickly enough? Mm -hmm. And that's the discussions that we're having at the moment and, and saying, OK, then, understand it will take time. It's a large organisation. These are significant changes that you're talking about and the discussions that we've had. But we need to know, and this is part of the role of the steering group, how do we assess that? How do we make sure that you are on track? Um, and that's, that, that, that's being put in place at the moment. Um, I think in terms of some of the some of the other issues, we have um, the representative from the London Children Safeguarding Board, the Chief Executive of Camden, on there because the HMIC report, yes, is about policing, but it's also about the partnership working that needs to take place. And there's um, some very very good work taking place at the moment around um, custody and children in custody and how do you provide either secure accommodation or how do you ensure that children are properly looked after when they, are, when they are coming into custody. And there were things in this report around that, around use of cells instead of detention rooms. That's something that, that we've had, to, you know, we're looking at and, and trying to understand in terms of the state's transformation, what can happen through that to make that an easier prospect and is that being, is that being factored in. And also around appropriate adults. So what you know, there was an issue around the yeah. attendance yeah. of, or the, yeah. you know, the calling of appropriate adults. These are all being picked up. We have oversight that, of that through a steering group, and that will continue and will continue on into next year as well until we're confident that the changes are taking place. And does the steering group meet? I think it's about every six weeks. Every six weeks. Um, given the recent report, yes, obviously there are a few, you know, few things flagged, but there are still some concerning sort of routine things that perhaps you might have hoped would have changed a bit more. What, how are you changing your oversight arrangements? What things are you focusing on so that we start to you know, speed up some of these changes where we can? So we very much focus on the report in terms of the recommendations. Um, HMIC attend the steering group as well Good. to give that feedback and be there. And I think that's really important as a critical friend. Mm. It doesn't, mm. doesn't affect the, um, obviously it doesn't affect the report, no, but I think it's really important that we get their first-hand experience of what they mean by their reports and what they're finding. So each time we are, that, that, depend, that sort of uh, will um, mould what the focus is of the steering group. I think what we've also got to understand, and I think in some ways, it was very much in the first report, but the in quarterly reports haven't had this in so much, but we mustn't lose sight of. And I don't mean this as an excuse, and it doesn't mean that we're complacent, but the first report talked about capacity. It talked about, and we've already talked about, investigation through Grenfell, yeah, but the lack of detect, you know, the problem with the numbers of detectives in the Met is an issue, and it's an issue around child protection investigations as well. So we mustn't lose sight of that capacity and the stretch that the, the Met are under. But we also mustn't lose sight of actually 
what the performance framework was before and the HMIC report picked up on the MOPAC 7 and the fact that it was only volume crime that was seen as, seen as important. That's a large cultural shift of looking at vulnerability and harm. That does take time and we're certainly, you know, with the Met trying to drive that through. But we mustn't lose sight of that, that there's capacity, there's cultural shift and then actually it's a change in what we are asking frontline police officers to think is their day job and to really think about the focus is not to lose sight of the volume crimes but actually safeguarding and vulnerability and harm. We've got to be thinking about that all the time. Okay, well, thank you very much indeed. Thank you. Uh, Jane, you've got a question? Yeah, I want to ask particularly about missing children and I, you probably answered them talking to my question but it's really what action are you taking to improve your response to missing um, children? The HMIC report so there was a failure to take cases seriously. Well, that's disappointing. I have to say I spend a lot of time out on the boroughs um, and um, they were, for example, concerned about the role of the coordinators, whether they were suitably trained, suitably consistent. That I know we have addressed. Uh, when I go into the um, missing people units that, that we have, there are very dedicated, very skilled, very capable people there. They're working alongside the people who are, as I say, dealing with child sexual exploitation. Uh, they're thinking about that. They're trying to do problem solving with the um, uh, institutions. Craig may have the figures, but they, in, you know, there's a, a inevitably, but it's probably, there's more to do to solve these problems. A huge proportion of children that are going missing are repeat missing from a small number of institutions and um, we think that there's often more that those institutions can do to um, either stop uh, you know discourage stop or indeed um, deal more effectively once somebody has left without involving the police uh, and there's no doubt more that we, we can do to help them and we'd, so, so that is happening all over uh, London and um, the you know the duty inspectors uh, take their roles very seriously. It takes, you know, I've got, <laughs> I've got very personal knowledge of this. I've watched it several times. Um, your average duty inspector is often spending, so they are in charge of the whole policing of the borough. whole borough yeah. for an eight, ten, or twelve-hour period, and they might spend one, two, three hours dealing with nothing but missing people, because that is how our processes are set up yeah. to ensure that they are quality assuring what everyone else is doing and that we're doing it to the highest possible standards. As a matter of fact, I think some of that is over-engineered, and I'm going to under I'm going to de-engineer some of that because I don't think it's the right way for them to be spending their time. But it's a sign of uh, the seriousness with which this is, this is taken. And um, I think the officers are getting more and more alert to vulnerability, as I've said, and the underlying issues that they need to think about. I don't want people to think that we don't care about people who are missing. We really do. We do take it seriously, um, and we have a huge amount of resource, a huge amount of resource involved in uh, looking for and um, then debriefing people who've been missing and trying to prevent them going missing again. And, and just to reassure on that, so high-risk missing people are some of the few things that are flagged to us each morning. So on our, our sort of overnight brief, if you like, about what's going on across London, there'll be those high-risk missing people will be on there in terms of uh, some of the numbers and the detail. But some of the numbers behind this are huge numbers. So if you look back over 10 years, 72% rise in missing person investigation. We're growing 8% year on year. In <coughs> And the thing that if you talk to operational officers, they'll say, in increasing frustration that the only response to missing people is a police response. There is no other. And it's a fear that they're in danger, isn't it? Yeah, but it's not always... Got. So if you then look at the figures that sit below that, so children who are graded high or medium risk, about 41,000 in the last full year, that's 100 a day mm. that go from children's homes, schools, somewhere where there's a loco parentis, and the only people doing the work are us. So you put that with the 100 and, you know, we spoke before, the 175 calls a day we're doing for mental health calls. That's somewhere in the region of 500 officers who are doing that work before we get to any of the other stuff we've talked about this morning. Before we get to moped crime, violent crime, or attending a, an S, we are doing huge volumes of other work now. And that's, you know, that's the way the, the service has gone. 
Um, I don't think we should be surprised that we see some of those difficult challenges, and the report talks to some of the difficulty of grading it for a call handler. Um, they exercise some amazing wisdom, call handlers. Um, if I showed you all the rules about whether you're absent or actually missing, I suspect we'd have 13 different opinions around mm -hmm. this arc. We shouldn't be surprised at 11 o'clock at night that people in amongst a busy volume of calls sometimes, so I'm far more forgiving on getting it wrong. I think the point the Commissioner made, you've got to look with the missing people. Did we expose anyone to actual risk that they're now missing or in some way others? That's where that report is less clear. I've noticed also that with social media, there are now lots of requests yeah. from yeah. police. Yeah. Yeah. Can you locate? Yeah. 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 And I had a recent example in my borough of Enfield where they've started doing a lot more yeah, that absolutely. tweeting and it's led to some rumours that actually there's a particular issue in the borough with gangs coming out and um, 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 involving young people and sending yeah. them out of London yeah. to county plans. Now, the Enfield borough have recently just tweeted that actually the numbers are similar to before, it's just yeah. that they've started using yeah. social media yeah. a bit more. Yeah. Yeah. It, just, it just struck me. Um, do you have protocols and onto sharing that sort of information as to when you do put young people's pictures on social media? Was, or, was, or is it for each borough to decide? No, no. So, so some of it, of course, is, is dictated. It will depend on the age of them. It will depend on family consent. So for, for obvious reasons, yeah, yeah. some people, a parent or guardian, will say, look, I don't want you to do that. I don't want some of these sorts of things. But that's the sort of complexities of debates that, you know, as, as the Commissioner highlight, officers are involved in on a daily basis in terms of making those difficult calls. At some point, it may be if there's a real fear as to what's happened or we've got some information or intelligence as to what's gone on with an individual, it may be entirely appropriate that we do go a step further. But clearly those are the exception. I've had the conversation before, John, I think with Len, that I'm, I'm really eager that we don't sit here and second-guess the operational yeah. decisions of our yeah. people unnecessarily. I actually want people to be mm. working with their common sense within sensible frameworks, not tied down by a million protocols yeah. and rules. Yeah. And I know you weren't asking for that. Yeah. And for them to um, keep in touch, which we all can much more easily now, and learn from each other's experience. Um, we are using social media more and more on occasion that may raise concerns or look um, you know, hard to explain or clumsy. I've actually, somebody yeah, showed... I, was, I, show I, wasn't, I wasn't alleging it was either yeah. of those things. Yeah. Yeah. But I, I think, I think it's good that they are using... Yeah, yeah. I, I, I saw the reporting tools. yesterday and it does intend... To, it does, you, know, you could be forgiven in the media reporting for thinking that we, are, we have said, which we definitely haven't, that there are children being sort of snatched and disappeared. That is absolutely not our assessment of what is going on at all. Um, far from it and uh, uh, yeah I'll leave it at that we will be using social media more in the future I'm sure we don't want to raise fear un unnecessarily but it is a fantastic mechanism for finding people and if you want to find anyone under 25 if you're not on social media you're not going to find them <laughs> Thank you. you want to come in? yes uh, Commissioner sorry Commissioner um, obviously one of your priorities is protecting children against child abuse but sexual abuse yeah uh, we saw when we, you know, uh, took evidence before that obviously this is increasing very worryingly. Um, I wondered what is the position in the Met, in the metropolitan area, in terms of grooming, grooming gangs of the sort that are very topical at the moment that we've seen in other cities. How much of a part of your, of this particular function is, it, does that take up for you? Is it something you see in the in the metropolitan area, or is it growing, or that particular part that we saw in, for example, Rochdale, Rotherham, Bristol, mm. Oxford? Mm. I'm, I'm afraid I can't tell you how many sort of active, and they would be proactive investigations of that sort that we have, but because awareness has gone up so much recently, um, such within our staff and also, of course, within um, other public authorities and in the public mind as well, you will perhaps have seen some coverage earlier this week in relation to East London and concerns around um, children in Stratford. doesn't suggest there's a network, but it does suggest that, that children are being um, uh, groomed out of particular kind of locations, you know, given, uh, in, I'll come away from the specific, but, you know, encouraged to get involved in criminality or sexual uh, relationships through suites and offers of this and that and the other and people actually just being interested in them perhaps when nobody else is. It's a really complicated area. I don't know how many current investigations we have. 
it is growing, there's no doubt about that, but a large amount of the growth, in my view, is about raised awareness. Is about? Um, is about raised awareness, undoubtedly. Um, and it's just, you know, it's, I, it's not the same phenomenon, but it's slightly similar to, you know, the, the viewing of indecent images. You will have seen a, perhaps, a, a, a report not long ago that suggested there are up to 900,000 people in this country who are either would be classified as paedophiles who have or have an interest in uh, children sexually and will be perhaps potentially be viewing child sexual abuse um, images. You know, for us, we have an ever-increasing number of referrals in relation to that, and I'm expecting to have future referrals in relation to organised or semi-organised grooming of, of children. <coughs> But I don't think this is a sort of in, a phenomenon that was invented in um, in the last few years. It really wasn't. It's been part of our society probably for centuries and centuries and centuries. It's hard to know exactly what has, okay. what, you know, whether it's really going up and what's changing. I, yes, but I'm talking specifically where we've had these shocking situations that have seemingly been tolerated for about 20 or 30 years. In fact, the time is actually going further and further back in time. Uh, so you're saying that pr pretty much those sort of patterns are not really happening in London? Uh, or are you saying... Uh, or, what sort of pattern? Well, for example, where we've had particularly girls, uh, white girls, being abused by uh, mostly Asian men, basically in quite organised groups that we've seen over the North and in the Midlands. Mm -hmm. Is that actually happening in London? Uh, we've undoubtedly had and do have now investigations into organised grooming of children, yes. And where is that happening in London? Um, I genuinely can't tell you today, and I'm not sure it would be appropriate for me while we have a proactive investigation going on to say I, it's in such a I don't think you could place. answer that specifically, but Commissioner. that's not really... No, I think with no. respect... I, I, I understand the trend of your debate. No, I understand your thrust. Because what we don't want to gain is yet another situation where people are saying, well, where were the police? So I'm not aware, personally, I'm not aware of a uh, matter which has been brought to our attention where we think, uh, we are sitting th here thinking, oh my goodness, we've, we've, we've had some knowledge of that for decades or years and years and years. What I am aware of is this is a current and definite phenomenon in the country, not precisely, I wouldn't share your words of describing it, but children being groomed in well, organised semi Why would you not share my way of describing it when it seems quite clear? Well, I, I would describe it as children are vulnerable to grooming. That is going on. Sometimes that's in a very organised and sometimes in a semi-organised way. And it is happening in London as well. And we have a number of very skilled investigators who are working on proactive investigations in that field. OK. I, I, I would say that I don't quite understand why you can't take my characterisation, which is absolutely factual and clear, why you don't accept that. I'm just saying it's not words I would use. Yeah, thank you. Um, some of the, some, thank you, Peter. Some of those questions were something that you're going to cover, Susan, but you've got some more points to make, haven't you? Um, yes. Um, uh, Commissioner, CSE has been identified in the Mayor's Police and Crime Plan as mandatory policing priority in every brother, borough. Has this actually had any impact on the way the Met's no, approach to CSEs, or are you carrying on because you always were? No, I don't think we always were. I think it is true that we're getting, you know, better by the by the day and the week. And the focus that has been brought by it being part of the, of the policing and crime plan, and also, of course, something that the HMI are taking a lot of interest in, is important as well in just keeping up our our um, improvement. And, and are you finding there's a, a, a continuing in increase in all of these things that is of concern? It is of concern to our officers, both because they're very complex to deal with for the reasons we've partly discussed already uh, and because it's you know serious and pernicious and completely you know affects people's future life chances if they've been subject to of sexual exploitation either face to face or indeed uh, in the online world um, and yes it causes us a great deal of concern in terms of demand and impact okay um deputy mayor what research has been carried out to review and build understanding of cse in london we published a sexual uh, needs assessment probably this time last year, which looked at, yes, around adults, but also looked at uh, young people as well. So that's been part of the 
uh, assessment of the demand and of uh, the need in London, but then there's also obviously the reports and the recording of um, sexual violence or sexual abuse as well uh, added to that. But there was the sexual violence needs assessment, which I can send to you, and the link to that, um, which is part of part of the way that we have assessed it and then how we then, through our commissioning, try to ensure that our commissioning and the services that we commission meet that need that has been assessed. And are we quite happy to look at everything, regardless of possible worries around cultural issues, etc.? Because we are aware that we have to be very careful what we say, what we do, what uh, you wouldn't use the words Peter did. But um, for reasons I'm sure we all understand. But sometimes we might get to the point where we just have to say things as they are and we have to start looking at things as they are and call it as it is. Um, yes. There's such a reluctance for so many to go near things that, that, that there's a nervousness about. I don't think there is any reluctance from the Met or City Hall to call it as it is, sexual abuse well, is sexual... We just heard it this morning. Sexual abuse mm -hmm. is sexual abuse. Sexual violence uh, or any type of uh, child protection issue, whoever commits it is committing a crime. Then you absolutely have to call that out, and there is no reluctance to do that whatsoever. But what there matters is that it's identified, investigated, and the perpetrators are brought to justice, and the victims have their support, their, their needs met through victim services and ongoing support. That's what's important. I think that's absolutely what we're trying to do through the steering group from the HMIC report, but also through the police and crime plan. And the sexual violence needs assessment shows where we think there's need and where there's demand. And if you read it, you'll be ve I hope you'd feel comforted that there is no reluctance whatsoever to call out sexual violence, sexual abuse, or anything like that, wherever it takes place. I think well, if you came to see my teams and you came to see my officers, and I'd really invite you to do it, they're not afraid of anything or anyone. They will go where the evidence takes them. They'll be careful about their language sometimes because it may not be helpful to label or stereotype when it is not actually accurate in our current context. But they will not be afraid to go anywhere with any issue. I can assure you of that. Well, I'm very, very pleased to hear that. And I sincerely hope if any of them ever do and get um, criticised for it, that with, there is enough support for us all to say they're calling it as it is. And that's where I get concerned. Mm. But if, if that is happening, I'm very happy to hear that. And I, as I say, I only hope that if they do say things because they're calling it as it is, that they are then supported. Well, it's All a right. slightly parallel issue, yeah. but I've, I've right. recently myself been criticised for calling it as it is in relation to a race issue. Not by I'm many of us, I can <laughs> be assured. Yeah. I'm going to move it on to the last question, but there is, I, I, just want, uh, I just want to clarify the, very briefly, the, yeah. the, 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 there may be no agreement or meeting of minds, the disagreement in phrasing that you think you've heard, Peter, and then we yes, can kind I, of finish I, it at that. I have to, yes, exactly. I'm not just constantly trying to make a a point, one that you might think I would typically make. But the fact is, is that it's to say that I don't recognize this situation and to somehow smooth it over is what led Commissioner to t thousands of young girls being shockingly abused over about 20 years at least. Leave it at that. No, no, and just, no. just no, no, the group were on the other foot, Commissioner, mm -hmm. if this quite rightly, if this, and quite rightly too, if this were groups of white men abusing specifically Muslim young girls, this would be treated probably as a hate crime and also it would be treated very specifically in a particular way, which it should be. But why are you therefore simply not taking on board what is obviously the fact that we see reported every day? Okay. Um, that's, that, could, yeah, if you'd like to respond to that last point. So I, think I may it's, have it's misheard and misunderstood what you said, but what I would say is I'm the Commissioner of the Metropolitan Police. I'm working here in London. It's the most diverse city on the planet, and I have crime of all sorts affecting all sorts of communities in all kinds of different ways. And grooming of children is not exclusive in London to any particular community as far as I can see. I've got all kinds of challenges in boroughs in the north of London of young people being groomed by a multiplicity of different uh, people from a multiplicity of different backgrounds. So the characterization that you gave then, which you may say is factually correct in terms of history across the UK, is not my current environment. That's all I meant to say, Peter. Yeah. Okay, I think that's the point well made. Right, and thank you for that clarification. Now, the last question we're going to 
bring into play is regarding the issue of Damien Green, who I understand is under investigation from the Cabinet Office, and that there may be an investigation into former officers. So I'll just paint that context, but I think, Len, did you want to? So we do the easier question first, I think, in terms of lessons arising from the Damien Green affair. Um, not many members will know around this table that we played a little cameo role. In fact, our previous mayor was investigated um, and did not, it did not find him guilty of breaking any uh, codes of contact, both in the GLA and the MPA. But it did characterise these actions as extraordinary and unwise. I would commend this reading and read between the lines of this 70-page document about the activities of Mr Johnson. Now, this arose from the briefings that you gave to the then current mayor, and I think you also had contact with David Cam Cameron. Mm -hmm. I'm always taken, and the pictures have been back on the screens, as the police enter the office to be greeted not by Mr. Green, well, Mr. Green, mate, no, I don't think he was there, but by a bank of te television cameras and pho photographers. Um, one of the issues that the recommendations are rising out of this is that, that a protocol should be established about briefing uh, politicians because the nature of, I'm not suggesting our current deputy mayor or even this mayor would transgress in a way that I believed that transgressions were made uh, previously about this case, but is there a protocol that exists about briefing uh, both the mayor, deputy mayor, on sensitive, I think the Damien Green would come into the sensitive category of investigations around that. What's, what exists, what's the understanding that exists in those circumstances? Well, Shall I start with Sophie first, give you a breather? <laughs> <laughs> I've got some more questions for you, it's up yeah. to you. I'm, I say, but it's a so I remember both. that. I do, of course, I do remember. I, w I was of the three of us the one who was around at that time, and um, in relation to the matters at that time, uh, I was a deputy assistant commissioner, and my <coughs> involvement, such as it was, uh, in that case, was um, well documented in my evidence to the privilege committee. So, I, if people are interested in that, I'd be, I would refer them to my statement to that because I, I was involved at various stages in various. Uh, not wishing to downplay it, but small ways, not in the whole investigation. Um, uh, now, one of the recommendations uh, that came out of the HMI work after that was in relation, as you know, to how um, leaks from uh, government, as might be characterised, were best dealt with. And that undoubtedly resulted in a uh, rather formal protocol between the Metropolitan Police and other police services indeed, but we tend to lead and the Cabinet Office, and we comply with that entirely, and it does have an element of it which is about, about briefings. Um, more generally, I do not think we have, Sophie will come in, I don't think we have a written down protocol it about how we may to choose to brief or not brief, brief on sensitive matters. It may not have carried over from the MPA days yeah. to the MOPAC days. It's about corporate memory, I think, in those issues. Yes. And I just wondered whether, you know, in terms of protection of both sides and the understanding of some of that, that, that issues, that it's worth considering. Mm. Uh, sorry, so, sorry. Well, yeah, no, I, I don't think there is a written protocol. Or if there is one, I I've certainly haven't it. seen it. And I don't think... I've not briefed. But we are very careful. Mm. Uh, so on this one, Craig yeah. is leading for me. I've not had any... For obvious reasons, we have not briefed Sophie on anything that's happening. Speaking generally no, no, about sensitive cases, because yeah. I think in the nature of a police, police yeah. crime and commissioner... Yeah. There needs to be some interaction, yeah. but I think the understanding and the lessons learned arising from this report yeah. was that it was unwise for a mayoral statement to be made, it was unwise for the mayor to have contact someone who had been arrested uh, and had and conversations uh, in, in a set essence, um, but in terms of public statements saying, well, actually, he thought that the police were wasting their time and there was nothing in it. Do you know what I mean? So these things are difficult, and for reasons you'll completely understand. And we, you will also be aware that we, uh, the, the people who led that investigation were very careful during the uh, phases leading up to that day to not brief all sorts of people who they were then criticised for, for not briefing. In fact, I once read a paragraph which criticised them for briefing the Home Secretary on something and for failing to brief them on something else. Um, it's very tricky. We have to use our common sense. We are operationally independent. We don't want to put 
mm -hmm. uh, the deputy mayor or the mayor in a difficult position in terms of um, conflict. This is an operational matter for us. Craig is leading. He hasn't briefed Sophie, and that's we, we will work our way through whether we whether and when we do. In that particular instance, of course, it was it was getting into the public domain at the point at which the mayor was briefed. Uh, and by and large, it, it works. In terms of confidentiality, it works yeah. at that stage. If I can lead on to my next question, and maybe, Sophie, you'll look at the protocol, whether it's needed or not, and come back to this committee, because it was work established, and I think sets some framework for that relationship to work in. It's not to inhibit the conversation, it's to say this is the circumstances, and this is a, a, look, a warning about the activities you can do post that briefing, uh, around that, and I think that's uh, something that's worth reminding us of. Commissioner, you've made some statements about some of the ex-police officers. I don't want to go into details in case, though, in terms of ongoing issues, but would it have mattered if those police officers had said it confidentially and not had publicity attached to their comments? Does that f change the nature of uh, an inquiry going on, could be policing or otherwise, that if you have information that you think is pertinent to that inquiry, if, if Len Duval rocks up and says, I think I know it, but I'm not going to talk to the press about it, I'm going to talk to the people carrying out that inquiry in a confidential way, does that, is that different from where, you know, in terms of the statements that have been made by the Commissioner and HMI, and if I address it to great... Craig, does it, you know, what's, what's the rules for the ex cops? Where does it stop? Where does whistleblowing come into it? Because it's a sort of whistleblowing type, I'm not suggesting yeah. this case, but I'm thinking about the future for ex police officers around on it. Can I take it away from this case? Because yeah. for obvious reasons, yeah. let, let, let's talk yeah. about a, 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 yeah. a, a, I'll try and address the two points. Mm -hmm. So that the learning from general leaks and the work around that. Uh, the Commissioner's covered the, the protocol around that. To reassure you, part of the protocol of that debate is who gets briefed and when. So that is covered in those processes. So if I take a, a completely different type of leak inquiry from another government department, at a point there would be a briefing, but that's all documented, who, why, where and when. So on the, on the, on the detail, and this is where you go back, and, and it's really simple, we just go back to the law in terms of what you can and can't do uh, in terms of these processes. So in relation to the, to the specifics of the case, I think Commissioner's made the position very clear on that case. So in terms of if I have information, I feel I need to tell anyone, there is a legal framework that says how you can do things, what you can do and when. There are, th there are certain defences to things, but that all clearly is very context specific. Um, so what we do with officers when they leave the service, uh, they sign a notice in terms of things like, so let's be really clear, stuff like the official secrets is very, very clear uh, in terms of where it is. Um, we talk about duties of confidentiality as well uh, in terms of information we, in, it, we uncover and impart. And depending on what you then need to tell, you would then have a conversation about how you would do it and what you would do. Okay, so, I mean, let's take it into the context of the sexual abuse cases, VIPs, of some yeah. officers having information and then going out. I'm still unclear. So, you're telling me there is a, con there is a confidential way that I could disclose well, information? You, no, it, it would depend on what your information is you oh, need to disclose. To relate. Well, that's so, right. If I believe it is pertinent to the inquiry and associated with you a certain might, type of bit. But even, even then, you've got to pass the public interest threshold. I can't oh. just... I can't just run around the place saying, I've got confidential information, what inquiry wants to talk to yeah. me? Um, <laughs> so there is, there is, there is a... No, there I'm is not a, saying that you hook yourself around, but if you see something, you think, actually, I think I've got something. So, Go so I, I mean, if I could take to sort of just basics. <laughs> My view is <coughs> we all accept when we become a police officer that we're going to come into contact on a daily basis yeah. with highly sensitive and often very personal and definitely confidential information, which is protected by the law. And, and by our discipline code yeah. as well. And we know full well that if we um, broadcast that, if we publish that, if we tell someone in, inappropriately that, we will be investigated by professional standards or the Independent Police Commission and we will find ourselves potentially charged either under the Data Protection Act, Misuse of Computer Act, could possibly, but more likely, misconduct in public right. office or a disciplinary offence. And sad to say, it isn't um, you know, a completely rare event. No. And you'll see if you went back over the last couple of years, there have been a number of officers, more than I would like, 
who have been prosecuted in that manner or dealt with in disciplinary fashion and sacked. Everybody knows that, very high awareness of it. Um, and people do generally, um, the vast majority of them take the protection of information really seriously. In my view, that duty does continue after you leave. Yep. Now, of course, you're in a slightly different position after you leave. But if you feel there is information that might be relevant to a current matter or an inquiry or criminal investigation, whatever, and you believe that the data holder of that information is the, is the commissioner of the Met, then in my view, <laughs> your first action would be to come back to the Met and say, you know, there's this piece yep. of information stored in that document over there that might be relevant to those people there. Now, if if you can't do that for whatever reason, if you feel that, you know, if, if, you're, if you get completely blocked off and you feel that there's some overwhelming public interest, um, there may be another route. And we, I, if it was me, I would always go down the confidential, you know, that yeah. practical approach and the confidential route. But if you felt that there was some, um, you know, somebody's going to lose their life because inappropriate inaction is being taken by the commission to say, well, of course, then there may be an occasion when it's appropriate, but it's very extreme circumstances. We can see some further clarification coming out and being much clearer about what those routes are, about confidentiality and I coming back if you necessary? feel you need no. to share it. No, I I, 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 as I say, I think the law is very, very clear. Or, uh, mm. Law and process. Public interest is there is. The only time when you would do it. Yeah. Mm. Mm. You may think it's clear. I'm sitting here and I'm still but struggling at the moment because I'm thinking, if I've got something, can I approach you then, Commissioner, and says, actually, this is going on, and in my job, when I previously worked for you, I come into this uh, information and this evidence, and I feel it should be passed on. Do I leave that with you to pass it on, or do I go and then say, listen to you to say, yeah, pass that on, that seems appropriate. No, don't pass it on. We can paraphrase here. That's a bit too sensitive for the people right. we're looking at. So, what, so what's the clarity in this? So, so I Sorry, I'm a cynical old no, soul. No, no, no I know you're. Bear with me. No. Bear with me. Think, you know, maybe I'm not being uncharitable no, 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 about no. how the system works. No, you, but, you know, having been in it for some time. So wherever you are, it's about it's about balance, yeah. isn't it? The law is very clear. Yeah. The confidential information needs to be kept confidential unless there's a yeah. public interest in not doing so. You have to, in my view, exhaust all legitimate ways of dealing with this before you go public. Excellent. That leads me to my next question then, because I think, Commissioner, you've said uh, everything else in following the evidence and whoever you are in terms of how you're treated. Do you know what I mean? In terms of where, where we come from. Let's get some clarity. Uh, we don't all agree, even in political parties. MPs aren't above the law, I presume. Is that still the Met's position? And if there's evidence that there may well be some criminal behaviour that needs investigating, the police will investigate MPs, and if need be, we've got protocols or procedures that says you can investigate their office and computers. Or is it a no-go zone? I'm watching all this commentary around the Damien Green affair of where people are saying, actually, no, we should be treated differently. We should be. This is not right. This is not proper. So. No one, is the no, no one is above the law. That has always been the case yeah. in this country. Long may it last. And that is absolutely the police, you know, the attitude of the police service that I lead. And you know, um, Len, you're looking at somebody who has led some of the most uh, sensitive investigations in the last 12 years and some of those which have taken us closest to people who either are extremely powerful or feel or and or have privileges of various sorts and we will not hesitate when it is the right thing to do i can assure you of that certain professions have certain protections journalists have protections around how and in the manner in which we can investigate and seek information in certain circumstances that's quite proper obviously it's a you know it's a political decision the law is the law and we work with that so we recognise there are certain uh, protections and that we have um, certain protocols but in terms of how we would now work with uh, Parliament and potentially material that could be subject to parliamentary privilege, but nobody's above the law. Thank you very much for that clarity and I'm fully supportive of that position, actually, in terms of that. No one, celebrity, people in power, Politicians generally, local, regional, whatever, police and police officers yes, absolutely. Absolutely. should be able to be pursued. Okay, then let's go back. You sometimes the Met is accused of taking too long in investigating issues, right? 
we get to a situation here of where the investigation you know, is chugging along and is primarily about a leak in an office and there are some allied issues that come to light. Those allied issues are not illegal at that moment in time, but some months forward, we would be fully aware they become or potentially become illegal. In what circumstances... I know there's no retrospective issue about the changes in the issue, law of pornography that took place literally two months after uh, the raid. So you're looking at me blank. Uh, I'm, 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 we're, try, we're just trying to follow your... Sorry. Uh, I, there's two problems, two, yeah. really, Len. One is I don't think either of us are quite with you. No. And Sorry. secondly, well, we and don't want to talk about the specifics yeah. of this case. We are not I think going we, to I think let's, let's just draw... Look, let's just get yeah. to... Link, if I, say. I know you don't want to talk about specific, yeah. but you, you have, you're not sure of a, of a reference point that Len just made. Do you just want that clarification? But, and I, I'm conscious of time I'd, as well. I'm happy to take it away from the case. Good. But I, and that... So what circumstances would, if you're investigating one issue and um, you're proceeding with it and comes to light a potentially a issue that is going to become illegal sometime in the future, would you retrospectively go back and double check or would you give words of advice that, that, would, that would, that's potentially going to become illegal in the future? What happens in those circumstances? Did you treat someone differently? I suppose my real issue is, did you treat someone differently because of who they were in this case? Can you give me an assurance of that? Um, in terms of these circumstances, did you treat them differently because they were an MP? And if it was Len Duval down the road Everybody and you did dancing. this, you wouldn't... I, I, we, I honestly, because it's a 2008, 2009 investigation, I can't go back and answer that retrospectively for you. I, I can't do it. I will come back to you then in writing and put it to you then, and if we could then share it with the rest of the committee, as we may I think that will be. We may not be able to answer the question, but of course you can write it to us. Yeah. I, yeah. I think we reached a kind of a, a, sort, a sort of in, yeah. oh, a sort of impasse where Len, you're going to write. Yeah. Yeah. Impasse. Yeah. We we'll write and follow up. Not I think an impasse. It's Len, you're going to write, are you, to the Commissioner? Yep, I will. For clarification. Andrew, briefly. Yeah, well, well, actually, I was on the Privileges Committee at this time. <laughs> um, I was there for nine years, actually. And, and I thought there was a, a, sort of an agreement with the Speaker that the police wouldn't go around knocking, knocking AMP's doors in without approval from the Speaker. Am I, am I wrong about that? When I said there are special arrangements, arrangements. For, uh, par with yeah, Parliament, Parliament. Yeah. and secondly, to um, protect information which could be subject of parliamentary privilege. That is exactly the kind of thing that I was referring to. There's a protocol, yes. Yeah, yeah I thought so. And, yeah. and, and does the Wilson Doctrine still apply in relation to surveillance? That's a very... Goodness me, it's a while since anybody asked me that question. <laughs> Andrew, talking about but things um, that no one else is aware of around uh, the uh, chamber. It's actually right. very important. Right. Well, well, Tony probably is aware, no <laughs> it doubt. Exist. <laughs> it's actually very, very important. Well, anyway, let's move it on. Come. Right, have we've we answered that. We've got to that. We haven't got an answer, no. Um, the <laughs> you don't you don't need to uh, answer if you're not in a position to. I would like you to write to me on that if you don't mind. Obviously, we've got the Investigatory Powers Act that has come in, um, and I need to double check whether it is um, whether the doctrine itself is applying in the way it once did. I mean, I mean, but I mean, the protections are clearly there, yeah, Andrew. Yeah, you know, you know yeah. that. I mean, I mean j just to finish off on this point, I'm, I realise we're the time pressure. I mean, one of the issues, having been an MP, and I suppose for all of us, is, is the ability of a constituent to bring something to us, mm -hmm. knowing that it will be treated confidentiality, mm -hmm. in, confi in confidence, if that's what they want. And I think that's one of the key things of course. That, that, that gives rise to some of these privilege issues. Absolutely. Yeah, no, that's completely. Fair point. Yeah. In fairness, yeah. it's not unique to MPs or councillors. No, I'm just no. saying. It's so, so this comes up with legal teams, with yeah. investigations Absolutely. into NHS trusts. So these are things we, we do wrestle with quite a lot. Okay, absolutely. Right, thank you. So absolutely. we come to an end there. I first of all, thank you very much. I think you're going to write to us. I know no doubt people have been making notes of this around demand response time on DV. Um, also, the top 10 reasons for 101 calls yep. and the numbers around that. Um, services across boroughs uh, for uh, enhanced women's services and Len will be writing and probably Andrew will be writing in their own uh, regard. Right, thank you for that. Just very quickly to move, move on. Item 6, if we may, can ask an updated work programme to be agreed by the committee. 
can ask the committee to delegate authority to me to agree the arrangement for a round table meeting with custody representatives this afternoon. Uh, de de delegate to me in a consultation with party group leads a scope of reference for the thematic meeting January, February and March, putting my teeth in, and agree in relation to urgent matters only a general delegation of authority to me. Date of next meeting is Wednesday 11th of January. I wish everyone a happy Christmas. End of meeting. GLA Chamber Sound. GLA Chamber Sound. GLA Chamber Sound. GLA Chamber Sound.